Welcome everyone. So many good friends here today. Peter, long time no see. Peter from TNO, ex-colleague. We have a great, really great group of friends. Carlos Dominguez from Barcelona. How are you doing? You look fantastic. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you and welcome. Welcome to the number 15 of the EPIC Online Technology Meetings. We actually came up with this concept of having 31 meetings in 10 weeks. It looked completely crazy. And so far, we're still alive and we're still doing it as good as we can. I have just a couple of things to tell you before we go with the people that matter. The first one is that we are extremely happy with the concept and we keep getting more and more positive feedback from all of you. We already planned 16 more meetings after this one. I just would like to ask you that if you want to participate in any of these meetings for you and also for people who are watching us in YouTube, let us know as soon as possible. Seating is limited, especially the slots to give a presentation. So please, please, the sooner the better so we can plan accordingly. We are now 500 members of EPIC. It's uh, 500, actually 556. For those of you who are keeping track, we keep growing almost two or three every meeting, 556 now members that are supporting us. And I also would like to remind everyone that even though Anna and me are here today rocking the stage, we have the support of a great, great team and there is a lot of work behind the scenes. All of these people are working from Monday to Sunday, answering emails, checking presentations, making sure that we have enough speakers, enough participants, that the IT is working well. So I would like to thank all of this fantastic team. This is a dream team of people. I'm very happy to work with them. And out of all these people who are in charge of the events and providing market reports and making sure that we are connected with the companies and we have the proper network and also that we help the companies in Epic that are looking for investment, there are four racing stars uh, that are really racing racing and shining, shining very brightly. Today, you're going to have the chance to know the technological knowledge of Anna in the field of biosensing and integrative photonics. We also have an expert on medical, Elena Veletskaya. We have an expert on lasers and metrology, Francesca Moglia, and an expert on optics manufacturing, Sana Pica. So you are looking for uh, connecting your company with any of the potential partners, suppliers, customers that we have in EPIC, in the 554 members of EPIC, contact them. They are here to serve you. They work at EPIC, but they work for the EPIC members. All of you are frustrated because we are confined, also confined here, uh, but the situation will be soon going back to normal, whatever normal will mean. I will say this, whatever normal will mean, the situation will soon go back to normal. We have planned great events in Q4 20. 20, especially the one that we have at Philips, so medical device manufacturing. So you are looking for contacting with system integrators and end users in the medical segment. We have a meeting, fantastic meeting, first week of December, 8, 9 December at Philips in Eindhoven, Eindhoven Rock City. So plan your calendar accordingly, it will be a fantastic meeting. And also remind you that all of you are EPIC members. I think, yeah, I think actually all of you are EPIC members. So all of you have access to a long list of market reports. We have tracked 17,000 market data, view graphs, charts that are there available to you. So please, from time to time, check the market reports. Last week, we bought the Worldwide Market for Lasers, which is the best market report available in the laser industry. And a few months ago, we actually purchased the market report for medical wearables. So I, I actually also read the market reports, not only Biden. And this, this market report, you actually have a very good overview of the different silicon-based technologies that are right now deployed in the wearable segment. And actually, there is a very interesting segment for measurement of temperature and also for biosensing. So I recommend you to read this market report. All of you who are members of EPIC have free access of the market report. And for those of you who don't know how to find it, very quickly, send me a quick email and I'll let you know. Super proud of this. We have actually started the biggest this is already the biggest website for finding a job in photonics that there is in the world. This is the biggest website for jobs in photonics, www.jobsinphotonics.com. So if you are looking to fill any of your job vacancies, let us know and we'll post the job vacancies there. Actually, we do our homework, so we scout the website, so the 555 members of EPIC, and we make sure that all the job openings are set in that website, and at the same time, we actually using recruiters, we make sure that talent gets to see their job opening. So we are extremely proud of this. Before I give the, yeah, I give the floor to Anna, only one more thing, we are broadcasting this meeting in YouTube. 
this is not a webinar, which is an online meeting between all the people in the Zoom window, but at the same time, we are broadcasting it in YouTube. So for the YouTubers, if you have any question for any of the participants, it's posted in the chat, but for the YouTubers and the people in the Zoom chat, if you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, all you have to do is send me an email and I will introduce you. I love connecting the industry. For me, this is something I love doing. So just let me know, Jose, I would like you to introduce me to the person that we have at Medtronic today at the meeting. I will make that introduction. And with this, today is a great day for many people, but especially for Ana Gonzalez, because this is her background. Ana, what's in the menu today? I am so excited to, to, well, to share this meeting with Jose today because this is my favorite topic uh, in the world. Uh, yes, this is uh, the agenda that we have uh, today. We are going to have uh, Laura from ICN2, uh, Luke from Surfix, uh, the EV group uh, and Johan, it's the CNM. Uh, but well, uh, we usually prefer to, to present uh, yes, in this way, you know, presenting the complete uh, supply chain. So, well, as Jose said, the, the goal of this meeting is to establish new collaborations between the 34 companies uh, attending right now. Uh, and for this, uh, what we need is a very good representation of the supply chain. So what we have here for biophotonics? Well, we have uh, companies that are developing uh, solutions for photonic integrated circuits for doing this biosensing chip. We have here the main uh, silicon nitride foundries, but also indium phosphide, uh, SOI, um, programmable uh, peaks. Uh, just to mention that regarding indium phosphide foundries, uh, we participate, uh, we are participating in this initiative for the pylon lines uh, in photonics. In this case, it's for the development of indium phosphide peaks uh, using JPEX uh, pylon line. So if at any point you would like to explore this possibility, just contact me and we will put you in contact uh, with, the, with the corresponding people. Uh, but also we have uh, companies doing uh, lasers or another kind of components such as micro optics. For this, we have uh, at this uh, new pylon line, uh, Fabulous, uh, for developing uh, micro optics. Uh, that is also necessary, uh, it is key for uh, biophotonics, but we have, for example, a Delta optical thin film uh, regarding uh, coatings for filters. Uh, and we will have a, a presentation from, for, from Surfix uh, regarding biofunctionalization of, um, of, uh, for biochips. Uh, we have uh, other companies, well, in fact, we have many different levels of the supply chain, the chain represented here. Uh, very important, the end users. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Medtronic that will participate in the discussion as a big end user uh, for this kind of technologies. Uh, we have uh, research uh, and development institutions such as uh, the ICN2. We are also going to have uh, a talk uh, from IMEC that will represent uh, from the packaging and assembly, uh, the PIXAP pylon line, that is the pylon line for packaging and assembly, photonic integrated circuits that will present a new solution uh, for packaging biosensors. So very interesting. We have other uh, companies uh, for system integrators such as, such as Weatherford, uh, Huawei, companies uh, for manufacturing equipment such as Fentica, uh, well, um, for microscopy, um, well, uh, I think we have here a good representation of the supply chain and there are going to be very a lot of opportunities uh, to make uh, new connections, okay? Uh, and well, having said that, uh, it can be the moment to present our first speaker. Uh, I am very, very glad to present uh, Laura Lechuga here finally in an epic meeting. Uh, you have to know that I have been working with Laura like 10 years. Uh, yes, she was my former boss, uh, my PhD director. Uh, so, well, Laura, I, I, I really want to see uh, what are you going to present here in the, what are the new results in the biosensing field. Uh, and yes, uh, when you want to start, the floor is yours. Maybe you can, yes, you can push the presentation mode. And I'm going to unmute you. Okay, so thank you, Anna. Let's see what happened. I'm trying to share my screen. Well, it's not working now. It was working. Now, now it's, yes, perfect. Well, no, no, because it's not in presentation. So I don't know why it's not in presentation. Just a moment. Uh, I think I have to go out from the, um, just a moment. I think I have to uh, open it in the PowerPoint. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Uh, 
Well, if I can, if I can make an introduction of uh, the Laura's work, I think I can because. Um... Okay, now, now it's ready. Okay, <laughs> sorry. You know, sometimes um, it happened that you have hoping before. Sometimes it's not working in the presentation mode. So, well, thank you for inviting me, Anna, and thank you to Epic for for inviting me here. Uh, so, well, I decided because we are just in the middle of this pandemic, so I decided just to show my our technology just using our new European project that is called Combating COVID-19 Advanced Nanobiosensor Platform for uh, the Global Diagnostic and Surveillance of COVID-19. Uh, COVID this is a new European project that was granted in the express call launched by the European Union in January. We have started already at the beginning of March, so we are the only group that has been working, so we are not under confinement and we are even now I am in, in my lab in this moment. So the European project is, we are four partners. Uh, it's my group from Barcelona, from the University of Barcelona, one group in Italy in Rome, and one group from the University of Marseille in France. Okay, so probably you know, all of you know by now, I hope, uh, how is the diagnostic strategies for the SARS-CoV-2. And you know that it's possible just to detect all the RNA, I mean, the genomic detection, or you can go to detect all the antigens, I mean, all the proteins and the envelope of the, of the virus. And this is the, the direct way to detect the disease, but it's also the possibility to make an indirect detection using serological analysis, okay? What we call this immunological reaction to the, to the disease. So probably all of, all of you know that in all the countries, the, all, everybody's using PCR. So this is the main and the goal technique just now uh, to detect the COVID-19. Uh, this is a, a, sense, a technique that has a very high sensitivity, specificities are very well established. But the main problem, as you may know as well, is the time-consuming procedure. And then you need any personal, it's limited to lab, and they have some issues on the reproducibility. So it's here where the biosensors are coming because we think that we are able to supply a point of care biosensor. Then the main point is that we have a very easy diagnostic so you can do outside the laboratory. Uh, many of the biosensors can afford label free, high sensitivity, a very fast diagnosis in a few minutes. You can detect the disease, you have multiplexing capabilities. And what is more important, the idea is that you can't uh, use a minimum sample treatment. I mean, you can even operate with untreated sample. Okay, so in our project, how we are using photonics. So in our case, we are using this, uh, a new photonics biosensor platform. We are using silicon nitride interferometers. I will explain later on. So this is a technology that we, we have been developing for many years. And the idea is that we can provide a very fast diagnosis of this, uh, of the disease without requiring any strong equipment. Okay, so in the project, we have the arm production of all the proteins, antibodies, anything that we require in our technology. And we are going to do, we are starting just now with a sample preliminary result, how it's possible to do the diagnostic with the COVID-19 human sample. And then we are targeting how it's possible to detect the whole um, virus and what we call the antigen detection. I must say that just now there is no commercial solution available for antigen detection. So there is no way to detect the whole, the whole virus at this moment. There is no commercial solution. And then there is, uh, we are going to develop with the biosensor, the RNA label free detection. Uh, in our project also, we have a second year part where we are going to use the same technology for the surveillance. This is important to make the surveillance of the coronavirus also in the reservoir animal sample. Okay, so what is the technology that we are using in this um, uh, here, uh, as you know, one of the most powerful biosensor technology is the one based in the vanessing wave sensing. And why? Because in, in, this, in this way, we are detecting just how the electromagnetic field from an vanessing wave traveling in an optical wave guide that is interacting uh, with the biomolecules in real time. And then there is a, a local change in the refractive index and induce a change in any of the optical properties of the light traveling here. So this is uh, uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main opportunity of this technology that they have a very high sensitivity while you are operating in a label free in a real time and a multiplexing uh, um, environment. So we make a com uh, just a comparison with the different technologies, plasmonic, rating coupler, micro ring resonator, interferometer. So we can see that the highest sensitivity is always to the interferometric technology. Most of the people have been working with Mac Thunder, my group, and also Carlos and, and group, and so on. We have been working with Mac Thunder for a very long time, but also a few years ago, we just uh, introduced a new concept called bimodal wet guide interferometer. 
So look here that the sensitivity that we can achieve is close to 10 minus nine refractive index units. Okay, so this is the bimodal wet guide technology that we have been working for many years. So now Anna knows quite well this technology. Okay, so this is just, I cannot go in detail. So you can see also in our publications, but then you can see how it's possible. Just, I mean, we just uh, um, introduce one mode of the light and then in, uh, we use a, a, a junction where we split in two modes of the light and from here, uh, we are uh, traveling in the sensing area. We are traveling the fundament, the first mo fundamental mode, first mode, and these two modes make an interference. So we just detect from the interference what is the number of molecules that has been detecting on the surface of the sensor. So it's making an interferometer just with one single wet guide. So it's a very simple concept. Okay, we have proved that this is one of the most sensitive in anything wave sensor that you have been published. It's a very simple one. Imagine it's solid was one single wet guide operating in the, in the visible range. We are using silicon nitride technology for the fabrication, and then we can fabricate hundreds of devices per wafer. Okay, so this is our work, how we are developing a point of care, a complete biosensor platform. So the technology, the fabrication is done at the uh, Microelectronics Institute of Barcelona. There is a presentation later on, so I don't have to go here. And then the, we make a, a work also on the polymer microfluidics. We have a strong expertise on the surface biofunctionalization of the silicon nitride. We even know now we have also some techniques for the packaging and storage of all the biochip. I mean, when you have complete the complete the sensor and the biofinalization, we develop the cartridge. We have uh, also developed techniques for the solving the lighting coupling, modulation of the interferometric signal, and of course, all the opti optical signal processing, electronics, and so on. Okay, so uh, you can see also in our publication that we have for many years, we have been developing many different applications. So the main target in our my group is not only to develop the technology, to develop prototypes, it's also how it's possible to make real time detection in real samples. So you can see here is our target is always to use um, urine, serum, plasma, tissue, wastewater, uh, ocean water, whatever. And the idea is that we try to do as less as possible sample treatment. So it's just take the sample, a very, very uh, uh, small volume from the sample and then put on the sensor and get a signal. So this is, you can see that we have developed many different applications until now. Okay, so just to finalize, to say that in the combat project, we are targeting this ancient uh, detection. So the, the, we are detecting the complete unix of the, of the virus. And then the idea with our virus sensor is that we are going to monitor in real time. I mean, we are going to allocate the sample from the patent. Probably we are going to use saliva. And we have already some preliminary result because we have developed also the some serotypes for the virus. We have the antibodies, we have the proteins. I mean, we are developing all this. We are going to do also RNA, RNA analysis where we have some, some of the target, I mean, some of the sequences of the, some of the genes that are exclusive to the COP2, uh, to the SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA. So we are going to detect in real time. So means that in 30 minutes, we will be able to see without the need to any PCR amplification. And this was not originally in the combat project, but then we have also expanding now to the serological analysis. And we are detecting the antibody that the patents are producing against uh, the, the, the COVID-19. And also this strategy is very, very interesting to detect the individual that are as completely asymptomatic with mild symptoms and also for the use of epidemiological studies. So we don't, I don't have time, but we already have some preliminary results in the three of these um, this strategy that we are looking and that we are trying with our technology. So this is just a summary what we're doing with our technology. Just to say, uh, I know that I'm out of time, but okay, just to say that one of the most important thing in this uh, urgent call uh, for the European Union was that you have already a technology that you have already developed and you have already proved with many real applications. So, uh, so we just uh, that's the reason why I think we got this project and this you see here the two strategies for the uh, complete virus detection for the RNA detection and important in our project is not only for the patients we are going to go also in the second year to make the surveillance for the animal reservoirs in saliva and in feces mainly from bats and rodents okay so yes thank you to all my people that we are still working very hard since the beginning of March uh, in the lab so thank you to everybody
Thank you very much, Laura. Almost on, almost on time. Almost, sorry. No, don't worry, you are always on time. So thank you very much for this presentation. Well, for me, it's so exciting to see my thesis device uh, you said for this uh, for this application, no? And also, I know that you have been. I mean, the, the World Institute, the ICN2, has been open only for you, your group, to go there to work, yes. and you have been really uh, working hard for this. Uh, what do you What do you expect? What do you think that is going to be the time to the market? Ah oh, well, this is always the same the the the, <laughs> the difficult question to answer. So in the European project, I mean, we promised that uh, in the first year. Uh, we have to develop all the biosensor for the virus for the RNA detection. So, and also we have to have validated with real sample from the hospital. So we need to go even to the hospital in Italy with our colleagues. So this is the first year. So means uh, next uh, March, next uh, year. And in the second year, we're going to use the technology for, as I said, for the surveillance of the reservoirs animals. So, but uh, of course we are trying to go as fast as possible. As I say, we already have some preliminary result. We showed some of the result in the previous, the conference that we have last, uh, last week. So I think it's also available uh, on YouTube or in other, uh, I mean, in the web system. So. Okay. okay, so let's see how we can accelerate this, um, how we can see this uh, super wonderful sensor in the market uh, as soon as possible. Uh, because we have here uh, Philips, uh, we have Robin, uh, right? Um, hello, Robin, how are you doing? Yes, hello. So, okay, maybe you can you can introduce here what is uh, Philips doing in the field of uh, the packaging, right? And uh, maybe, I don't know, do you have any, um, any way to help Laura with the packaging uh, of this uh, biosensor chip? Yes, indeed, yeah. So, um, a little explanation for the Philips Invase services. We have uh, two segments, one which uh, maybe most people know is that we have a MEMS uh, foundry, but indeed also a uh, optoelectronic assembly clean room where we can package optical chips, optical components, where we have experience with uh, guiding in and out fibers, uh, lenses and mirrors, let's say. And I think our expertise specifically in the medical domain and biosensors is, uh, gives us um, yeah, the understanding and expertise needed to, to, uh, to, to manufacture these kind of modules. So I'm, I'm really willing to, uh, to exchange some more details on this, uh, this type of chip. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I think Laura that, that um, in the well, uh, following also my experience working uh, for a long time in your group uh, is I think we can you can take a lot of benefit from the packaging initiatives uh, that are going on now in Europe uh, in, in order to help you know so you can really focus uh, in what you, you do the best that is the biofunctionalization and bioanalytical um, characterization right and. And well, also we are going to have a, we, during today a talk from Pixar Pine Online. So you will see the details uh, of the Binuria, yes. Uh, so you will see the details of how uh, Pixar can help you with the packaging of uh, the bimodal web guide device. So well, uh, questions or comments from the, from the audience? Well, perhaps I can add to that that uh, beyond the packaging, that uh, I would like the attention for MedFab, the pilot line for medical photonics, where if you want to integrate more technologies, not only the biosensor, but uh, but other technologies for microfluidics or, uh, or other expertises, we're working there together to provide a, a one proposition for developing this whole pro a whole product towards a medical certified uh, device. So it also, uh, if you're interested in that, guides you towards the MedFab uh, pilot line for getting it to approval. To, to comment, uh, Anna, if I can. Uh, the first one is, I mean, when we are speaking about biosensor, we have to be careful because as you know, biosensor, I mean, the cartridge has to be disposable. So this is one of the main points that uh, you, it is going to be only single use. So you have to focus how you make your biosensor uh, in, in such a way that you can plug very easily and then to connect very easily and to, throw, and to take away. We are using nano with guys. So this is, I mean, a very tricky technology. This is one of the points. As you see, we develop also the engineering of the device. And the second point and with biosensor is always a problem of the bio. So the biofunctionalization, because you have to preserve the activity of biomolecules. And this is one, one once they are covalent uh, attached to, uh, to the sensor surface. So this is one of the most difficult things uh, I, have, I have this experience. So this is something that we have not to forget. I mean, that you have to plug something to, I mean, to a cartridge that is to single use. And second, 
this, I mean, you cannot underestimate the problem, the, the, the difficulties of the surface value of personalization. Okay. Especially if you want to treat untreated sample, because our goal is always not to make any cleaning, anything from, this, from the patient sample. I mean, you have to use the crude sample and to put on the sensor. And then Laura, you will say that the main challenges that you have right now to, to going on with this device are the biofunctionalization, right? And well, the packaging? Well, I, I don't see the surface, the functionalization because we have very well established protocol and they're working very right well, uh, but mainly the packaging, packaging to, I mean, to do a commercial device is really, really tricky, I think. Yeah? Sure. From the YouTube universe, Laura. Laura, I have a question from a company called Icon Photonics, which is one of the companies I really look up to in the fiber to chip coupling. They mm -hmm. are wondering about the, the optical losses that you can live with, and you could share with us a few of the challenges related to the mm -hmm. fiber to chip coupling. Okay, we are, we are not using fiber to chip coupling in this uh, in this sensor. At this moment, we are using M5 coupling. And we and probably we are going to live with this. I mean, that we can use uh, this M5 coupling and also with some kind of uh, vertical coupling and something, I mean, some technique that we are using. Uh, this is one. So we don't, because in the case of the fiber coupling, if I remember that this is single use. So you have to make the chip, I mean, include this, the chip, and you cannot have this fiber coupling. So this is one. Um, and the second was the optical losses. We are using silicon nitride technology, with dry. So I think there is a presentation later on from CNN. And you will see that we have a very good, I mean, we have very low losses. This is not a problem. And also here is an interferometric detection. So remember, of course, as much light that you have better, but it's not a problem of the intensity of the, of the power of the light that is traveling uh, there. But in any case, there are very low losses. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, that has a number later on, but it's very low losses. So what we're using is silicon, nit uh, silicon nitride by LPCVD, so. Okay. So thank you very much. So if there are no more comments, questions. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, considering that you're using silicon nitride of, um, LPCVD, how would you, how, uh, maybe it's too early to say that, how would you estimate the pricing? The pricing? Now we have some estimation of the pricing, uh, even the, a high estimation and we think that the uh, the price for each um, test uh, could be like 10 euros or even less. So it's going to be even less than a PCR. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Okay, more questions, comments from the attendees? Okay, so if not, let's go ahead with the program. And well, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker that is uh, Luke uh, from Surfix. And he's going to talk about this, one of these uh, main challenges that is the, the, chemist, the, the chemical uh, modification of the surface and the biofunctionalization of this kind of chips. So look very well. Now we can see your screen if you can put the presentation mode. Yes, very good. I cannot hear you. I'm going to try to unmute yourself. Unmute you. Um, No, we can still. I'm not saying anything now. Eh? Okay, now. We can hear you loud and clear. The floor is yours. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yes. Uh, Surfix. Surfix started uh, nine years ago. Uh, started with a strong focus on surface chemistry, surface coatings. And uh, we moved, um, we started very broad in different fields and we moved slowly, uh, became more narrow. When we moved into the fields of uh, lab on a chip and microfluidics. And in the meantime, uh, we uh, ended up doing more and more work on photonic biosensors. Um, and last year we have been acquired by the Lionics and Curin. And that has to do with the fact that we believe that we need um, more key technologies uh, together, yeah, create a consortium uh, to, to move to a commercial product uh, and accelerate the development of it. So our goal, uh, why we do this is uh, to, uh, to improve diagnostics uh, based on a photonic biosensor, just like, like the talk of, of Laura. Um, yeah, we uh, bring together these, these state-of-the-art uh, 
components for this purpose. Uh, as you can see on the right, so we have the, the photonic chip. Um, we have uh, surface bring in the nanocore technology and Curin uh, brings in the biomarker uh, know-how. Uh, so that makes three Dutch companies um, uh, that are working on this, uh, this topic. Um, so I, def yeah, I was allowed to have three slides. So this was my first slide. And now I still want to tell something about the photonic chip, the nanocoating and the biomarkers. So that makes another three to go. So the photonic chip, uh, it's coming from Lyonix. It's uh, an asymmetric uh, Max Zener interferometer. Um, it's based on a robust triplex technology, um, which has extremely low uh, propagation loss. Um, and it's surrounded by silicon oxide. And that is also a trick we, in the end, need for uh, the, the coating technology. Uh, the chip is extremely sensitive. Um, so it has more than 2,000 nanometer per uh, re re refractive index unit. And it's a benefit that it, it's made out of nitride. So it can be operated at 850 nanometers. Um, and that's important for, for instance, the miniaturization. Um, the biosensing, just like in the previous talk, is based on evanescent field and ex extends, let's say, 100, 200 nanometers into the solution. Um, and in this case, the analyte binding uh, causes a phase shift. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's depicted on the right. Um, so if the, the light is traveling to the waveguide, if there is something binding to these antibodies, uh, this phase shift is, is what you measure. Um, such a chip has an extreme low limit of detection. So it's a sub picomolar range. And uh, if you have multiple sensors on one chip, it's rather simple to apply it for multiplexing. Uh, the benefit of the system is, uh, and I think it's also a benefit of the, the nitride waveguides and, the, and the, the wavelength it's operated, it's that it is uh, has high potential for point of care diagnostics at a relative low price. Uh, because it's uh, easy to uh, have hybrid integration. integration. So a Vaxel light source can be uh, flip chipped on top of it. And also the, the, the photodiode detector uh, can easily be assembled on the chip. Um, and in that way, we aim for wafer scale manufacture of the complete bi biophotonic array, which means that uh, the, the whole, uh, yeah, it, all, everything is applied on wafer scale, including the the coating process and the biology, and also we are assembling uh, microfluidics on top, and then it's separated uh, into separate chips uh, or cartridges that can be used. Uh, yeah, so nanocoating technology, that's where we started with Surfix. Uh, state of the art is that we would apply nanocoating uh, in a new uniform fashion. So here is the, this, the design of the, of the Maxener chip. And um, if you would code the, yeah, so there's a sensing well, and if you could code this, the complete chip, so it's not only the, the sensing well as in the image, but also the, round, the surroundings would be this, this typical greenish color. And then in yellow, you have the antibodies on top, and then your analyte would bind everywhere. Um, Binding of, an of analyte is, of course, a very good thing to happen because then you can detect something. But if it binds everywhere, that is limiting your, uh, your sensor performance. Uh, that has to do with the fact that if you look at the surface area of the, uh, the waveguides, then it's a, a very small surface area that is actually your sensing element. Um, while the surrounding is silicon oxide or a cladding, um, everything that binds there will not be detected. Um, added to that, uh, if you have a microfluidic channel above it, then uh, that's what they call the, there's an unsteered liquid layer. That's what they call the depletion layer. So uh, actually the, 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 the fluids are hardly moving there. Uh, that's why they, it's almost standing still. So the analyte transport, yeah, the analyte, which you would like to detect uh, in that area is very low. So if you lose all your analyte on your surroundings or 99% of your chip, um, you, uh, you will find difficulties to, uh, to detect at low, low concentrations in a rep reproducible manner. Um, so it, it actually you're depleting your analyte from the solution uh, by the surface surrounding the waveguide. Um, that, that is 
yeah, definitely a problem. So we came up our solution there as a selective coating. And how we do this is that we first coat the nitrite, which is more reactive than the oxide in, in our coating technology. Um, so we first have this greenish layer on only the nitrite. Then we have a backfilling step with an anti-fouling layer, uh, which prevents your uh, antibodies of attaching on the surroundings, but also your analyte. Um, and that's what you see over here. So it's, the chemistry is nicely following um, the chip uh, design. So there's no additional photolito or whatever needed. It's just a chemical, chemical trick, I would say. So what actually is happening then, if you flow a low concentration of analyte over the, over the sensor, means that you are not losing your analyte. And actually, you could also say that in the other way, in a reverse manner, you could say that you are concentrating your analyte on these waveguides. Uh, and that means that you will end up with a higher sensitivity and a higher reproducibility. And uh, actually, the effect becomes bigger if your analyte concentration goes down. So in the end, you end up with a lower concentrate, uh, lower uh, limit of detection. And that is what we just did uh, yeah, a few years ago with a relatively simple uh, assay. Uh, we compared the uniformly coated uh, uh, chip. So here the antibodies are on the silicon oxide and on the, on the nitride of the waveguide. And here we have this selective protocol. So the antibodies are on the uh, waveguide only, and this is a passivated with an anti-fouling layer. And if you look on these steps, so you, you see here, uh, uh -oh, the concentrations are not in here, but there was every time there was a tenfold increase in um, uh, analyte concentration. And I believe we started with 130 picomolar, and that was adding up. But you can see that if you, uh, so these are the highest concentrations, if you zoom in, here, for instance, the, the, the difference is biggest. Um, and that has to do with the fact that, uh, especially at low concentrations, you have effects of, of depletion of analyte. Uh, so this, the, the, the selected protocol, the coating protocol that we have is uh, significantly uh, enhancing uh, the sensor performance and gives you an increase of 10 to 100, 100 times uh, in sensitivity. So biomarker technology, uh, Curin, uh, one of our investors, they are focusing on uh, DNA-based early cancer detection from urine. So they're looking for small fragments of hypermethylated DNA in urine. Um, so here's some data. Uh, so the, the, the DNA fragments are really small. It's hardly any mass that you, uh, that if, if a few bind, there's, there's hardly any mass change. So it's small compounds. But still, we can reach uh, 10 picomolar concentrations. Um, so that is very nice to show, I would say. Uh, another one uh, based from a European project, uh, BioCDX, where we are looking at uh, cancer uh, biomarkers. Uh, some examples where we did some multiplexing. So you have several sensors on one chip. And if you spot uh, every, chancer, uh, every sensor with a different uh, a biomarker, then you can detect several at once. So this is a very nice example, I would say. And um, also recently we had a press release because uh, we already had the consortium with Lyonix, Curin and Surfix, but we added now one member to the consortium that's Photon Delta uh, because we, uh, with our current investors, including uh, Photon Delta, we are investing and accelerating uh, the development of, the, of this biosensing platform. Uh, in order to uh, uh, obtain a reliable COVID-19 test. And uh, if you would ask us, uh, when do you expect this to going to be commercial? Um, our uh, timing in that respect would be uh, six to nine months for a benchtop model system. And that is the last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luke, for a great presentation. We talk almost every year at Medica about uh, the, the progress of Surfix. I'm really happy to have you today with us. Uh, uh, you haven't been to an Epic meeting for a while, so you should know that there is a new style. Would you give a presentation and then people ask you, what can you do for them? What can they do for you? So what can the others do for you and what could you do for them? Yeah, good question. Actually, I do not know all others. I, I see some familiar faces, uh, but uh, yeah. 
Let me, let me let me introduce you to some of them because they are all my friends and we do great things together uh, in many different aspects. Uh, it is clear that you're working already with many silicon nitride photonic integrated circuits manufacturers, especially Lionix. Arne is there. Hello, Arne. You look fantastic again. Uh, I would like to introduce you to other companies in the in the supply chain. For example, in the in the field of uh, equipment manufacturing, there is a company also in the Netherlands, a beautiful city called Almelo. You know a company IMS. Nathan, how are you? doing today? Nathan, let me unmute you. I think I'm right now not on mute anymore. Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Ah, great, great. So I'm uh, very curious why you joined a meeting on biosensing. Could you tell everyone what IMS does quickly and also what could you do for them and the others could do for you? Mm -hmm. So I will introduce the company very uh, shortly. Uh, so yes, we're based in the Netherlands, in Almelo, close to uh, Enschede. We are a company that uh, is um, a machine builder and a system integrator. So that's where we are in the supply chain. We focus heavily on uh, the very accurate um, processes of aligning different uh, kind of components of, of different kind of products. And we can do that at very high speeds or at very high, high uh, accuracies or both. Uh, and together with that, we can also integrate a large uh, diversity of different processes as well. So currently we are uh, in the smartphone market. We are also in the automotive market. And in these markets, we have uh, some experience with the assembly of optical uh, components and optical products, uh, often also uh, with, with, with light uh, sources integrated into them. Uh, and right now we're looking to expand that uh, experience into uh, different segments of the markets. And we're currently seeing what would fit. So that's my reason for joining this meeting. So today we had uh, just a presentation from Surfix. Uh, and Luke is uh, already showing many, many collaborations. Luke, we are going to volume production with your technology, obviously. That's what you are aiming for. Uh, already we heard from Laura. Uh, what kind of companies do you need in the supply chain towards enabling the volume production of biosensors based on the surface activation of Surfix and photonic integrated circuits? I think that the, actually the, the, the match with IMS could be there in the sense that we definitely need a, a system integrator in, in the end. So we are currently working on a benchtop system, uh, but after the, so the, the second phase of our development will be that we move into a portable point of care device. Um, so there we already have collaborations, but uh, for instance, um, yeah, having the software, the readout, everything in a handheld device, for instance, that that's definitely there. there there's still room for, for new partners and, and new input and know-how. Good. Let me get you another partner. So today we had Metronic in the room. Metronic is one of these companies that everything that we had done on pressure sensing for, for detection of uh, heart diseases, they have been super helpful. But Soren said, I'm very interested in biosensing. And Anna and me got super happy. Soren, why did you join this meeting and what kind of connections do you expect afterwards? Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, I think, um, uh, I mean, I'm actually working on biosensors. So uh, it, it, um, from the introduction made, it didn't seem like uh, it was the right fit, but, but we are, have actually been working on, um, on um, competitive uh, assays for glucose sensing. So we know a little bit about it. So I was interested about uh, what's going on. Uh, I think um, in, um, I mean, it, it, we are interested in value-based healthcare. So this means basically you don't buy for the hardware, you buy for the successful therapy. And in that sense, we need to, you know, um, assess the treatment or the therapy. And, and in that sense, we, we are obviously interested in, uh, in all kinds of sensors to assess the, the therapy. Uh, sorry, when it comes to the glucose measurement, this is very interesting. What principles are you using for the measurement of glucose? Is it laser-induced fluorescence or are you looking at the, at the, at the biosensors presented by, by Laura? What, what is the concept that you have in mind or different concepts that you have in mind? Well, we, we, we use FRED 
uh, fast resonance energy transfer for the detection. So we had a competitive system uh, consisting of a, uh, a glucose receptor and, uh, and a glucose ligand uh, for this system. This is great because I we have uh, one of the first uh, ever comments to this meeting is the company uh, UPV Fab. Uh, my friend Pascual Muñoz is here. Pascual, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Uh, um, you look great with these headphones like this and the big smile. I want uh, people to understand this logo that they put for the first time in a supply chain. I put a logo called UPV Fab. What is UPV Fab? Uh, UPV Fab is an initiative that we are leading several, several research institutes at Politecnica de Valencia to take over the operations of a former solar cell manufacturing pilot line by a Spanish company Silicon. And we are retrofitting the equipment and incorporating new equipment uh, for, uh, for our own research uh, and also uh, to engage with companies. It is a great concept. I have visited the, 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 the laboratory. I was quite impressed. Uh, the, the, the kind of capacity that you have there for helping companies with the bank end and front end of any kind of silicon-based manufacturing. So Soren, that's a potential partner for the fabrication. But I want to go to another company first ever tying at an epic meeting, Plair. Plair. Uh, do you pronounce it uh, right? Plair or Plair? Hello. Uh, it's Plair. Player. So I, I have looked a lot when you register for this meeting. I look a lot what you do and about what you do in laser-induced fluorescence. What did you do in this meeting? What kind of connections would you like to have afterwards? So we have an expertise of developing and commercialization of instruments for airborne particle monitoring. And our focus is detection of microbes in the air for different kind of environments and different kind of clients. And so this kind of meeting is interesting for me to investigate new technologies uh, that grow from um, basically liquid detection always, but uh, we always try to find ways to apply this to air because air is more sophisticated, uh, I would say, environment than uh, liquid. And uh, there is always, always lack of specificity or precision. So uh, new sensors that can be integrated for the air it is really interesting for us. So look, as you can see, we had the manufacturing partners, we had the potential users on the on the bio part like Medtronic or on the airborne part as a supplier. Let's see what we can do together. And we have gonna put the whole supply chain. So we started from the photonics with Laura, then we took the chemistry. Now we're gonna talk about the micro optics and I'm gonna go to a beautiful city, Florian and Inn, in the border between Austria and Germany, one of the most beautiful areas of Europe. So whenever the whole borders open up and go on holidays, I'm gonna go to Florian and Inn and drink a beer with my friend Bern. Thank you very Hello, much hi. for being with us. The floor and the attention of everyone is yours. Thank you. I just share my screen. Second. I really love your background today. Eventually, <laughs> we're going to make a competition on the most beautiful background. You go presentation mode. Yes. Then everyone will enjoy the beautiful micro optics yes, that you can good. manufacture. The floor is yours. Thank you. So before I start, actually, I would like to give a very brief introduction to EVG for those uh, who don't know us uh, well. So uh, we are equipment manufacturer. So for the for wafer processing equipment for the MEMS, nanotechnology and semiconductor markets. And actually this year we have our 40 years anniversary. And uh, actually uh, recently uh, we came over our 1,000 employee. And we are headquartered, as I said, here in Austria, and we have fully uh, owned subsidiaries around the world here. So we're active in quite uh, many markets. So uh, here you see some of our recent developments. For example, we have a new hybrid bonding um, tool that is used for image sense and memory stacking. We have temporary bonding, debonding solutions. Uh, we have a fusion bonding tool. Uh, that is uh, used in the semiconductor front end of line market. We have a new mass class exposure technology um, that is basically digital lithography and also the, uh, our Hercules NIR system, which is UV nano imprint lithography on, on 300 millimeter uh, fully automated. Um, what is actually the impact of EVG on biosensors and life science? So we are involved in quite many areas here. So this ranges from personal wellness monitoring um, over healthcare um, applications, biomedical analytics, uh, and also to up to mission critical applications uh, such as implants. And we are 
making equipment. We are developing processes together with the customers for uh, which are, are crucial for many of the of these applications in these areas. And one of these con contributions are going into the MEMS market here. Then we have wafer level optics uh, solutions in place. Uh, we have the nano imprint lithography. Uh, we have microfluidic manufacturing. Um, and also a big and seamless integration, which uh, is playing in a more and more in, uh, important role here. So and for today, for on the topic of, of label-free biosensors, I would like to um, get into a few of these technologies that are quite relevant for, uh, for these biosensors. And I would like to start off here with the, with the nanoimprint lithography, because actually nanostructures are um, quite often used here in, in biosensing and in the microfluidics, which is related, of course, to the biosensing. Um, gives uh, you enhanced electrical signals, um, opti enhanced optical readout, can give you functionalization and so on. You have here these nano electrodes, nano wires, nano wells, uh, some optics, color filters, polarizers. And then you have on the other side the, the actual transducer device itself made of nanostructures. And one of these examples is given here on the right hand side. This is a, a photonic band gap sensor. Um, where you uh, basically detect uh, the molecular binding or the molecular interaction um, by looking at the, uh, at the spectral peak shift of the incoming and outcoming light. And uh, this nanostructure, what you see here in the uh, bottom uh, right corner, was actually produced on, on our uh, nanoimprint lithography system. Uh, and as mentioned before, we have here the volume proven uh, nanoimprint lithography. Um, tools in the market. We can go down this resolution in, uh, uh, down to 40 nanometers in production. Um, it's uh, really used in, especially in, in, in the optics market and in the biomedical market. And we have a long history actually, uh, which goes back to 1997. Um, but in the, in the recent years, we have seen here quite um, uh, a, a demand from the market for this high volume production. And that's why we have put all these systems in the, in the last several years um, onto the market. And uh, coming back to the, to the label free biosensors. So you've seen uh, the nanostructured biosensors you can uh, do in volume production with nanoimprint lithography, but then you need to integrate it as well with, the, with microfluidics. And there are several options actually. Um, but today I would like to highlight a bit the adhesive bonding because um, if we look on the functionalization, the topic we, we had already before. Um, so if you do this uh, prior bonding, uh, you need uh, a room temperature bonding process. And adhesive bonding is offering this if you use UV curing adhesives. And we have here a, 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 a selective deposition technology here in place that just puts an adhesive on, on top of the heightened structures, which has additional advantages um, of uh, basically no contamination of the microfluidic channels, which is um, quite important. And you can put thin cap layers on top. And, and as said, the uh, adhesive itself has a very, uh, is a very thin layer at the end. And this technology is actually quite um, well suited to uh, integrate such nanostructured biosensors with microfluidics. Um, there are, of course, uh, not only um, these photonic biosensors. Uh, nanostructures are also used in, in other um, bio applications here um, that uh, can be well integrated with this, te with this technology with, uh, and microfluidics. This uh, is in cell cultures, for example, in organ on chip platforms, um, in sequencing applications. Uh, cancer diagnostics or virus detection applications. And uh, last but not least, I would like also to quickly uh, point out that um, beside this um, nanostructure integration, uh, this adhesive layer transfer um, has also a quite potential here to integrate uh, CMOS or big uh, chips or wafers with microfluidic chips. Um, often you have here, for example, in a CMOS wafer, a first layer of microfluidics that di are directly on, on the chip already, and that you want to interconnect uh, with the actual microfluidic um, chip without any contamination here. 
And this is my last slide here. So EBG is not only a, an equipment manufacturer, so we are um, a solution provider. So people can come to us with an idea, with uh, an R&D process, and we are working here together with, with the customers to bring their processes up to, to volume manufacturing. It's not only about uh, nano imprinting, um, it's also uh, about other technologies that we have here in place, um, but especially on the, on the nano imprint side, we have also established a, a Neil Photonics Competence Center, which is really a smart way to collaborate with us here. Okay, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Bern. That was a great presentation, a very nice technology for microfluidics. So then, uh, following Epic um, Spirit, uh, can you tell us, uh, what, can you summarize what can you do for the, the companies in the room and what can do these companies for you? Actually, um, what, what we offer, what we can do, I have, I've summarized already quite, quite a bit in the, in the presentation here. So we offer, um, not only the equipment, but also um, offer um, here uh, the, the collaboration to bring up a an R&D process and idea uh, to volume production. We have here a huge clean room facilities at, uh, in Austria, but also in other places around the world um, where we um, work together uh, on such customer projects. And um, what the people can do for us is actually telling us these ideas, um, what uh, processes they want to bring up in volume production. And any kind of challenge, I don't know, in the field, in the field of materials or, or in order to develop further your, your products? Um, actually, in, in terms of materials, if you talk about this one, um, here we have also um, worked a lot during the last years on uh, material developments in-house, uh, especially for the nano-imprint lithography. Uh, we have here our own uh, resists and developments here, and also um, resists that are compatible with biological materials here, uh, with biological applications here. They are okay. used in, in such applications. Okay. I think Jose wanted to to add something here? Yes, a couple of times, yes. because you had a beautiful picture, Bernd. Uh, we talked a lot in the past with some of your colleagues on the role of FBG in the photonic intrinsic circuit, circuit packaging. Uh, you had yes. today a beautiful picture using microotics for the in-coupling or coupling of the lights. So I'm going to go to a very, very, very good friend of mine, Peter Hansma from uh, TNO. How are you, Peter, today? OK. Hey, Peter, how are you doing? Can I see you? Sure. Here. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So Peter has uh, been working on biosensors, uh, silicon photonic based biosensors already for many years. And he had a really revolutionary concept of free space in coupling or coupling of light. Peter, what kind of optics, or maybe you should tell us first why you joined this meeting, what can you do for the others? And then we'll discuss what kind of collaboration we can do with EBG. Well, uh, I've been working at TNO on uh, on biosensors for uh, many silicon or insulator uh, ring resonators. But uh, the, the biosensing activities of uh, TNO have been spread to us. A part of company Delta Diagnostic. Delta Diagnostic. <laughs> So this is uh, now TNO has a spin-off called the Delta Diagnostic, and they actually have a have commercialized uh, a setup. Benefit from, uh, from such an instrument. And the instrument is, uh, well, we have several prototypes ready, and they run very well. <laughs> So uh, one of the revolutionary parts was to really use completely free space for the incapping or coupling of light. Yeah. Do you use any particular lenses for this? Any challenge that you have for the companies developing micro optics in the room, especially EVG now? No, not, not regarding the optics, but the, the, the concept of uh, wave level attachment of microfluidic wafers and photonic sensors is very interesting. And of course, what, what would be also be Interesting is to combine that somehow with the technology from Surfix to get the functionalization somehow in that manufacturing supply chain uh, embedded. So that's, uh, that's, that's, I think, a challenge. And then also to make sure that when you bond the, the, the different wafers together, that you can still, let's say, have the, have the functionalization uh, in place and that you can still be able to, to store this for six months in a fridge or something like that. So I think that's really a challenge. 
definitely is something that you two, the two of you have to discuss offline. So I would like to remind you, I'm going to introduce you to you by email. And any other person who wants to be introduced to any participant just has to send me an email. I will make that introduction. I have a question coming all the way from beautiful city of Stuttgart. Asa is one of the young entrepreneurs we all have to support. She has something fascinating in mind. I think she tells more she cannot share. What's your question? Um, okay, so my question is basically to EV, 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 EV Group. Um, it's great to see you. I've been working with your devices many times when I was in Southampton Clean Group Fabrication Service. But anyway, my question yeah. is, you mentioned the PIC integration. Um, uh, I mean, I have two questions. One is that, so is it silicon you're referring to? Is it indium phosphide? And then my second question is that, assuming that someone comes to you with a problem and asking for a service from you, what sort of timeline can you do normally can consider for such a project? Uh, f first of all, they, they are coming to the to the integration. So because it's an adhesive um, bonding process, um, you are not really limited to to, uh, to any material. So you can combine here um, quite uh, different materials. That's um, where we have to work then uh, together here in, in the development process. And uh, the second uh, question is: We are um, actually in, uh, in the core equipment manufacturer. Uh, but we do uh, a lot of development work here, and we have also the possibility of, of pilot ma align manufacturing for, um, for uh, projects here. Um, but this we have to talk then uh, in uh, specifically uh, what, is, what is the need here. Okay, perfect. So we will make sure that you that you connect after this meeting. So let's move ahead in the program. And uh, next talk is uh, from uh, Johannem uh, Research, uh, Martin Smolka. Uh, so yes, is one of the partners in Medfab, uh, the pine online for medical devices, the new pine online in Europe for medical devices. So uh, Johannem, if you want to share, very good. Yeah, I'm starting to share, and I want. To present. Okay, so you can see my screen. Sorry, sorry, yes, sure. Perfect. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Sophia, that's nice. Okay, then first of all, thanks a lot to Epic for organizing this nice online meeting. So as you said, I'm Martin and I work at your name research. We are uh, Nonprofit research organization in Austria, in Weiz. And I'm working there at the Materials Institute, where we have five core topics, five research groups. And actually, three of them are contributing to our biosensor related activities. So, at our institute, that's a rather interdisciplinary teamwork. Um, so, what, we, what do we do in the field of biosensors? So, we are all asked of what we can offer to others. So um, I will start with that. First of all, we work on sensor chemistry, so on the molecules, which are the real sensing part in the biosensors. Um, we very much work in the direction of upscaling. So we print, uh, so we apply this sensor chemistry in printing processes, as most of our sensors are optics-based. So the detection is based on optics. We are working on micro-optics. And then for the final uh, upscaling for the manufacturing, we work on the materials which we need for replication. So the, there we are also working a lot in the direction of nano imprint lithography, like it was also presented by EVG before. And we also worked to get, together with, with EVG in a previous project. So um, we are then working on a topic which was not mentioned so far, so on large area upscaling on polymer foils. So we can maybe give here an addition to, to the collection of, uh, of manufacturing approaches. So, um, so what I will present is mostly polymer based and our special topic is the replication on large area polymer foils. So uh, first of all, how is that done? How is polymer foil based manufacturing done? So we are implementing so-called roll-to-roll processes. So which probably all of us know from printing industry. So from, from print industry, for example, from newspaper printing. So we go from small substrates to let's say endless foil substrates. And um, so like in semiconductor industry, 
Um, there's always a, a tendency to increase substrate size in order to, to bring down the prices per unit and to increase the total throughput. And this approach we are also applying um, here. So we, um, we change to a much bigger substrate in form of these polymer foils. And then, so our benchmarks are typically that we can get 100 of chips per minute. So we drastically increase the throughput. And um, the next step is that we can parallelize the, pro the following processes on these big substrates. So we don't need to handle individual chips. And uh, so far, this has been demonstrated um, quite often already in the past that it's possible to replicate, let's say, the microfluidic structures for, uh, for biosensors on foil substrates. But then we, we also went one step ahead. So together with Cyanian, we made a microarray spotter, which um, works on this foil format. So we first imprint microfluidic devices, and then we have a multi-channel, let's say, biomolecule printer. This is this roll-to-roll -roll microarray spotter, um, which is a rather unique um, contribution from our side. So we can um, print multiplexed patterns of, of biomolecules on these foil devices. Then, um, so I present two projects. The first one is one which we are coordinating. So that's called Next Gen Microfluidics. And first of all, it's an open innovation test bed. It's a rather new funding scheme from the European Union. And the central goal is to, um, to combine a pilot network, um, maybe from previous um, Horizon 2020 pilot projects, and then build up a upscaling platform and in, uh, in our case, our upscaling capacity is dedicated to microfluidic devices and, yeah, and here to biosensor devices. Uh, yeah, what I need to mention here, so, so with this network, we're also completing final backend processes steps like uh, lamination. So we don't just imprint and print biomolecules, but we also assemble the full device and have a big um, partner network there. Uh, everybody is asked um, what we expect from others. So we hope very much to find uh, new corporations. So to find possibilities for new um, implementations of biosensors in our technology platform. So let's say wherever pol um, mainly polymer based cartridges are needed. So we are a good partner here. Um, yeah, and, and we have part of the project budget um, reserved for external customer requests. So we, we can, uh, so we get our work funded, which we can dedicate to external requests. And then an important project, which was already mentioned. So that's MedFab, which um, is a pilot line project for advanced, advanced photonic medical devices. And with the presented um, technology, we are also contributing in that platform. And there, there is also this concept that external customers can, um, can request implementation in, of their technology in, in the MedFab platform. So far, that's my answer on the question, what do we expect from outside? Then, yeah, I have a final uh, slide. So I think it was already, the topic was mentioned on a lot of um, presentations before. So the current pandemic virus crisis so where we need a lot of tests, we have already seen that there are biosensors which, um, which can help us here. So it can, which do allow us quick tests either for the virus itself or for the immune response. And the contribution which we can make is the upscaling at, uh, um, at many pieces. So we talk when we say High throughput manufacturing, we talk about at least 1 million pieces per year and more. Um, so with our platform, um, where we switch to, to these 100 of, of chips per second, uh, sorry, per minute, we are way beyond the, the classic uh, manufacturing capacities. So that, that is a valuable input here from our point of view. Um, yeah, then I want to thank our partner network here from MedFab and NextGen Microfluidics and the European Union for funding our research. And finally, um, 
a picture how I looked before the crisis with a <laughs> bit less hair. <laughs> you look even more beautiful now. I actually think it's, uh, the, the, the crisis suits you very well. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, you know how it works. It's not your first rodeo. What can you do for them? What can they do for you? Quickly. Um, yeah, okay, so I tried to implement it already in the presentation. So what we, what we can offer is, so whenever, let's say, we are mainly working on polymer devices, so and it could be also applied in hybrid devices where you have, for example, a, a silicon wafer and combine it with a fluidic part. But mainly we are working on polymer devices where um, the detector is usually outside of the cartridge. So we are going to really low prices because we don't throw away the detector each time. So we minimize the functionality of the cartridge itself of the single use device. Uh, and there we have, have this manufacturing approach on polymer foils where we increase throughput and reduce manufacturing prices. And what we hope to get from outside is uh, collaborations either through MATFAB or NextGen Microfluidics where we already have established platforms and then and also can ramp up long-term corporations. Genome Research has been playing a key role in Epic on helping many different processes go to volume production. We have a question from beautiful city of Barcelona from beautiful Laura Lechuga. Laura, what's your yes. question? Um, because you are presenting that you are making this um, <clears throat> complete uh, process integration and you are printing the biomolecules, with, I think, with the Synthion technique, with the machine. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but in this printing of the biomolecules, are you using any coval, any chemistry, covalent binding, or what, or what are you doing? Because, I mean, if you're printing biomolecules uh, alone, I mean, you don't have enough stability, it's not robust, so how are you doing that? I mean, you, you need to do some chemistry before. Yeah, well, actually, uh, we demonstrated the technology in a previous EU project and um, built a DNA quick test cartridge. So that was for the partner James Bit Biotech in Austria. And there we, uh, we used a printing additive from, from the company Cyanion itself. So uh, that is UV activated after printing. Mm -hmm. And in general, it always depends on the surface which we are using. So we also try to tune the surface functional groups in our material. That always also depends on the patterning process which we use in detail. But with tuning the surface molecules, uh, we can also um, we can offer binding sites for the printing chemistry afterwards. But in principle, it's, it's rather flexible. I will introduce the two of you. I think there is something else you need to talk about, but let also uh, focus this a little bit. Uh, we want to find you potential partners. At some point, you said that you're interested in working with uh, some more R&D centers. We have, for the first time at an epic event, the Institute Carrot IBGG. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this beautiful afternoon. I will be very much interested in knowing why you joined this meeting and what can you do for the others and the others can do for you. Yes, thank you, Jose. Uh, so my name is Remy Wache, and I'm working for Institut Carnot IPGG Microfluidic, and we are one of the main research center um, uh, in France, based around the microfluidics. So uh, my interest today was to to hear about biosensor and to to have a look what can be done uh, combining different type of biosensor with microfluidics. Um, I know some of the people here around. Um, and uh, it's good to, to see this type of application. Maybe I have a, a quick question for you, Martin. Um, can you, uh, with what type of polymer can you, can you work? Uh, is roll-to-roll -roll imprinting valid for any type of thermoplastic or are there some limitation? So, um, I am already unmuted. Ah, yeah. um, so we have actually two lines for this first patterning process, for this imprinting process. And uh, the one which I showed you in the schematics, that's um, UV-assisted nano-imprint lithography, where we are using a UV-curable resin. So this resin is then the real material for the microfluidics. But then we have a partner which is doing extrusion coating. So there you're basically melting a standard thermoplast and then structure it. So we can work with both either fine-tuned um, poly polymers, which come from us or from our partner network, uh, which are UV curable or the standard thermoplasts, 
by extrusion coating. So we can work on both. OK. All right, uh, I'm going to introduce you to some other potential partner. There's a company that will really look up to at Epic. Leo is representing ProFactor. ProFactor is one of the companies who help in the volume production of different technologies. Today, we are talking about biosensing. Leo, why did you join this meeting and what kind of cooperation would you like to do afterwards? Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, why I'm joining the meeting today was also similar to uh, to what was said before, to know about more than the biosensing um, biosensing field. Also, my personal interest because I'm coming uh, from the biosensing field, uh, education-wise. So I did my PhD in that field. Uh, what we can offer at Profactor is, as you said, uh, some scale-up uh, techniques and approaches. Uh, to bringing such uh, things uh, closer to the market. And we have also some own approaches uh, where we're also looking for collaborations. It's very briefly. And Fantastic. Martin. <laughs> Hi, Martin. All Hi. right. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we really have a lot of room for cooperation here. And Anna and me, we're happy to introduce all the different parties. Before we go to the next speaker, I'm going to call uh, Laura because your presentation raised a lot a lot of interest in the YouTube. I have two very fast questions for you. The first one, can you compare what you're doing now with the people who are doing surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy? Okay, well, we are working with this silicon photonics technology, but at the same time, my lab has been working for many, many years in plasma. I mean, so fast plasma rational localized SPR. Uh, so I will say that working with plasmonic, I mean a standard plasmonic, so fast plasma resonant localized SPR is one of the best technology if you want to use for biosensing, it's one of the best technology, this is my advice. But uh, the main, I mean, but uh, we normally use, uh, for example, silicon photonics interferometric technology when we need much more sensitivity. So the main reason to choose plasmonic or uh, silicon photonics interferometric technology is the sensitivity. So what we can do, for example, uh, we can uh, achieve in, uh, in plasmonic, you can go to nanomolar, picomolar, but then if you go to interferometric, interferometric technology, you can go to picomolar, atomolar. So this is the main difference. In the case of the uh, surfaces in the cells, well, I will say that uh, this is a very sensitive technology but has many, many problems of reproducibility when you go for real sample analysis. And remember that if you are in the biosensing area, what we have to have in mind very clear is that we need to deal always with real samples. So this is what we have to show at the end, a real sample and, the, at, and to try to do uh, the less treatment as possible of this real sample, okay? This is one of the main message. So, and then with the SARS, you always have the problem, in my opinion, of the reproducibility for real sample analysis. The second question is, I think more or less on the same line. So you were very, very <laughs> explicit on having a very simple design, only one web guide, and you said this, this is super simple. Uh, the, I have a question which I'm gonna simplify. Why don't you like ring resonators? Well, it's not that I don't like a ring resonator, but ring resonator has the same sensitivity that surface plasma resonance. Remember that the sensitivity in a biosensor is not only the physical device, okay? We can have a very, um, theoretically, or even in the lab in the physical device, you can have a sensitivity, but you have to join at the same time with the biofunctionalization, with the microfluidics inflow, everything together. And then you have to do the analysis with the sensitivity of a device everything together. If you finally, when you go for a micro ring resonator, it's a great technology, but the sensitivity is the same than surface plasma resonance. So in my opinion, if you have to do something, surface plasma resonance is one of the best technologies, as I say, especially because the chemistry on goal is much more simple. And that's the reason why I'm not using ring resonators. Laura, muchas I, gracias. I prefer, you I have done. <laughs> okay. I, I prefer rings, but it's a matter of opinion. But Laura, you have done the best possible introduction to the next speaker. So we have different silicon native platforms, silicon native foundries in Europe. One of them is very customized to biosensing solutions. It's located in the most beautiful city in Europe, Barcelona. CNM, thank you very much, Jad, for joining today. And let us know how the supply chain can help develop this new foundry in silicon nitrate. The floor and the attention of everyone. Is yours. 
just uh, go to presentation mode. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, just to tell you about uh, the Silicon Nitrides uh, platform of uh, Performing uh, Biocenter, which is very, very, very related with uh, the presentation of uh, Professor Laura Lesula. Uh, first of all, I wanted to make a, a small overview about uh, our institution, which is the IMB CNM from the Spanish. It's a result, uh, this is institute belonging to the CSIC that holds the clear room for micro and nano fabrication located in Barcelona. The infrastructure and equipment allow for the development of a large uh, range of processes for the performance uh, and characterization of electronic and photonic micro nano devices. Integrated circuit and micro nano systems uh, in center for research, uh, de uh, development, and technology transfer to industry. With 1,500 square meters near room surface, it is the largest near room in whole Spain with a large amount of processes managed by our experts, ensuring very high throughput, reproducibility, and the robustness of the developed technology. Rubber, we have the capability for small and medium series production for dedicated component processes. Here, we are participating in several uh, regional, national, and international projects with a high focus on industrial companies. Also, within our three room is running a photonic platform based on silicon nitride as raw material. Different uh, web guys geometry and score thickness allow us to develop uh, photonic components ranging from visible to mid infrared wavelengths and technology development from the uh, CL2, so from concept to CL9, which is the market. Since the silicon nitride platform for net uh, infrared tape offers the possibility to fabricate prototypes under a multi project waiter team to share costs with uh, other customers by covering the expenses of only the specific area we have. So, within this context, uh, we represent the different fabrication uh, strategies that uh, we apply with our uh, partners. Uh, depending on the final application, this is strategy and uh, the corresponding technology and uh, photonic components will, do, uh, will develop under collaboration with other groups and companies according with its research or industrial objectives. Uh, consider that our uh, technology is a uh, silicon nitride. Uh, because it offers uh, several advantages comparing to uh, other technologies. Uh, since the uh, silicon nitride doesn't present the two photon effect, uh, very low uh, version, and it's transparent from visible to mid infrared. Uh, within this context, uh, Pascual Munoz uh, will talk more in detail about uh, this. Uh, uh, aspect in the coming epic technology meeting on mid infrared society. So, regarding the wavelength range, our technology is able to be used for telecom systems such as uh, wave filter, LIDAR, programmable fix or, uh, for near infrared and mid infrared, or biosensing mostly in visible range, as you can see in, the, in, in this part. Which is dedicated to the ICM so, uh, In this case, we show um, a single bay model with guide by a sensor based on silicon nitride technology. Uh, also, we can show it here, which is in this case our first example. This is very really, uh, well known. Uh, uh, 
the modal interferometer, where the interference of two orthogonal modes propagated in a single wave guide is used as the screening method. Uh, we should note that the bimodal waveguide sensing structures were patented about 10 years ago and uh, employed successfully in several projects for the determination of different biomolecules with high sensitivity, selectivity, and low limit of detection. And now uh, it will be uh, applied for the development of a rapid test device for the COVID-19 under the uh, under the combination of uh, Professor Lechuga uh, that uh, she uh, presented uh, before with more detail. Uh, also, uh, in our institution, we perform, among others, a fluorescent nanoscopy, um, which is the sequence of fabrication based on a total internal uh, reflection to the text and see at the non characteristics uh, the molecule. This work was developed for our colleagues at the Arctic University of Norway with very low losses and high performance, and it exploited under the name of this nano imaging scheme. Finally, uh, we wanted to show other photonic sensing structures that gave high performances that we might talk about in detail next time. And uh, thank you very much for this uh, occasion also. And uh, please, I will be glad to answer your doubts. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, the very nice presentation. And I have to, to say that I am very happy with the CNN Foundry as all the chips of my thesis uh, came from, from here. So, okay, so, um, regarding challenges that you have, how the people uh, that is now in the meeting can help you? What are the challenges that you have for the companies in the room? Well, um, as you can see, uh, we offer. Uh, Stable, rubber, and flexible photonic technology for the development of uh, biochemical sensors that operate from the visible to the near infrared wavelength range and with possibility to expand up to the extreme infrared from the TL2 to the TL9, as we said. Also, uh, in order to expand the applicability of the developed technology, we look to reinforce the system integration with uh, new components able to solve problems like the input output light coupling, thermal stability, or either the packaging of them. Okay, so and what about the I mean what would you like to to how, what kind of contact would you like to, to make in this, uh, in this meeting? Well, uh, this is a very important question because uh, uh, we know that there are several companies uh, that they wanted to, to, to start uh, developing uh, photonic sensors, and maybe they are a bit lost because they didn't decide yet about which technology. So here we offer to them this silicon nitride technology. This is side. And from the other side, also there are companies, such as, for example, uh, laser companies, LIDAR, etc., et that they might have uh, some experience uh, to uh, help us to sell our, uh, like, this uh, coupling issues of uh, light which we have it. Okay, because uh, we can have one of these companies in the room because we have here uh, two six uh, labs. Uh, Julian from two six. Maybe would you like? Let me unmute yourself. Ah, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> ah, okay. Now, okay. So, me, would you like to to introduce what is your super big company doing and 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 also well, what is your interest in the biosensing field? Yeah. Thank you. So at uh, 2.6, we're a company making uh, laser 
other things. So 26 is a rather big company. We make also thermoelectric coolers. We make optics. We make uh, gallium nitride, silicon carbide, but I'm responsible for semiconductor lasers. And those are Vixels. So there was already a talk presenting how Vixels could be integrated, flip chipped onto a waveguide um, as an illumination source for the biosensor. So my interest here is that most of our of most of the products that I'm representing, they go into the consumer business. But I feel like the, the bio sector is uh, expanding and requires more and more um, optical sensors. And I want to understand what are the implications on the illumination. So I'm interested from the people in the community here, if they have special requests on the illumination, if they see that the roadmap should go in a certain direction for the illumination for the biosensors, I'm interested in finding that out. Okay, thank you very much, Julian. Uh, I think uh, Jose wants to add something. Yes, I cannot wait. I'm having so much fun. The meeting is great. So first, about the big cells for illuminating silicon nitride, I think one of the person I had to actually ask is my very good friend from the beautiful city in Enschede, uh, Arne. Arne, uh, silicon nitride is getting a lot of interest in the biosensor community, as you can be seeing. Uh, we had the presentation in the beginning from Laura, who was saying it's about making them disposable. And now we have Julian wanted to say, I don't know if my big cell can be part of this. Can actually, can we dispose a silicon nitride chip with a big cell? What do you think, Arne? Yeah, well, that, that's exactly what sold on our roadmap, indeed. The fact that silicon nitride is transparent in 850 makes them easily uh, usable with uh, the cheap 850 nanometer pixels. And these pixels are very suitable for reading out biosensors. And I agree with Laura that ring resonators are not always the most suitable one. We have asymmetric maxenas, which you can also very accurately read out in that way. But the key there is that these pixels are cheap then. Because what you want to do is you want to flip chip them on your component and either rework them or whatever, or but ideally throw them away after each use. So what you need is indeed um, cents or even below per pixel. And importantly, also per detector array. Um, but that's the mouse industry, of course, drove price down already. Um, and the moment these volumes indeed keep on going up, the price will go down further. There is nobody uh, in the EPIC community who understands the market of big cells in the volume production better than 2.6. Julian, uh, what is the volume? Is, is the cost of the big cells only driven by volume demand? Are the other factors? And what kind of conditions do we need to reach this number that Arne is putting, cents per big cell? Um, so yeah, volume is definitely uh, a driver for reduction of the, of the cost. However, I, also the application is a big uh, application and specification is a big driver for cost. So in the, some consumer applications, when we go into tens of million or hundreds of million of, uh, of devices, we can think of having devices in, in let's say below 10 cents uh, range. Um, what the volumes I've heard today, they can go maybe in the tens of million, maybe 50 million. I heard one million, more than 1 million from the gentleman in, uh, in Austria. So that would be probably hard to go to the single unit cent. Uh, well, what, 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 you, what you shouldn't forget there is that what you talk about here today is um, sensing platforms. And the platform is application agnostic. Basically. What you, that's why uh, Cervix is in the call. You make that platform smart by making it selective to either um, a virus or a certain type of cancer. And that specific platform um, for point of care diagnostics or for a certain kind of diagnostics use the same sensors. So even if one application has maybe 10 million or a million users, um, they all add up because they're at the same platform, just different biochemistry. So that's the nice see. thing of these markets is that you're not reinventing the wheel for every application. You're just reinventing the chemistry, the service chemistry, uh, or the, the chemistry on top for every application. Yeah, I'm so going to introduce the two of you to have a discussion about this because it's <laughs> still we want to buy a proper market reporting which defines exactly the amount of disposable biosensor the industry demands. I couldn't find it, but I'm looking for it. We are looking for that market data. But I have a request from the internet, from the YouTube universe. So Sumitomo has been very engaged with these uh, big meetings. And Yoshiaki Shikata, hi Yoshiaki-san, is wondering about having a partnership with somebody who can offer photonic integrated circuits in the mid infrared for glucose detection, for glucose sensing. Jad, you are opening a mid infrared platform based on silicon nitride. Is that correct? Absolutely. 
When, when is it going to be available? Are we can actually say part of our MPW run? Is there a timeline for this? Yeah, okay. Uh, as, uh, as we have said, uh, our uh, structures are transparent from uh, uh, the the visible, which is like the normal, uh, the most used uh, range for the for the biosensing, until the near and mid infrared. So for us, it will be a great vision to work in the infrared for the biosensing performance. At Epic, we connect the industry. For everybody who wants to be introduced to Yoshiaki San from Sumitomo, please let me know, and I will make the introduction. Back to you, Anna. Okay, thank you very much. And as you see here in the meeting, uh, Lambda X, uh, Thierry, uh, maybe would you like to explain, well, in, in a few sentences, what your company is doing and what is your interest in biosensing? Uh, as far as we know, you are acting in, you are active in, in, in fabricating medical devices, but more in the ophthalmologic, uh, ophthalmologic uh, field, right? Uh, yes, uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, one part of activity is actually to uh, make an optical metrology system for the ophthalmic market. However, we already worked uh, in uh, the biosensing uh, world and uh, we work with a company and uh, our interest there because we spoke a lot about uh, the chips, uh, the photonic chips, the microfluidics, the chemical treatment, uh, the how to make the bio them biology active. However, at some point you need to a uh, reader. And uh, usually this reader is made out of uh, some optics and uh, you either need to measure a fluorescent signal or to make an image or to make a spectroscopy uh, measurement like absorption uh, spectroscopy with ATR. It was mentioned by, uh, I think, um, CNM. And uh, actually what we do is uh, we help company to tune or to fine tune to uh, uh, their optical system based on the uh, reading principle, optical reading principle, and we work on the source. Could be we work with Excel, for instance, and how to integrate it nicely in a system so that at the end you will get the the uh, the good uh, device that you need to make the reading either on the handheld uh, um, uh, footprint or uh, a benchtop uh, footprint. So that's, that's what we do. We make optical systems that can uh, help uh, people uh, manufacturing biochips to get the appropriate reader uh, to make the diagnostic. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, so uh, more questions or comments for Jad? Okay, so I uh, actually, actually, uh, I would, uh, I had, uh, well, asked uh, Jose to make the introduction, but I was interested to, to discuss about uh, the with Surfix. They say they, they are also uh, working with on the benchtop um, a system to uh, make the reading out of their um, their bio uh, sensors or biochips, and uh, maybe uh, maybe if, if we have time, uh, Luke can explain a bit uh, how how does it. Uh, which kind of um, reading principle they use and, uh, and maybe the, explain a bit about the system level, uh, what are their challenges. Okay, sure. We will make sure that you connect with them so you can discuss. Okay, okay thanks. Okay, so yes, yeah, do you have any comment? You, you are mute. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of uh, comments. Uh, I want to to answer uh, maybe Asa from uh, Suska, that uh, I think he asked us uh, about the losses of the silicon nitride waste guide. So uh, the answer is that uh, it's uh, 0 0.4 dB per centimeter, and uh, we are uh, decreasing it. Ah, that is true. Yes, she was uh, she was asking for the for the values. Uh, yes. yeah. so, uh, that our um, our uh, silicon nitride platform can be accessed both or either by the multi project with uh, approach uh, or either uh, by a dedicated process. So it's like when it's uh, more open. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. Yeah. 
Uh, and let's move ahead with the program. I would like to introduce the, the next speaker, uh, another great uh, silicon nitride uh, foundry. So Aston from uh, Ligent Tech. Okay, so if you want to share your screen. Sure, just give me a second. Uh, not this one. Uh, can you share it? Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Very good. So thanks a lot. And it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, Legend Tech represents an integrated photonics approach here. So my presentation will cover what integrated photonics can bring to biosensing area and how Legend Tech can help you to succeed there. To start with a couple of words on what is Legend Tech and what is our place and value proposition in the photonic ecosystem. So we are chip manufacturing provider and we work with silicon nitride platform. We can cover all the stages starting from early prototype to volume production. And we supply our customers with photonic chips, which later on can go into a final product uh, module or a system. As I mentioned before, we are a part of the ecosystem, which means that we work and collaborate closely with uh, software and design houses, as well as with the packaging providers to ensure that the development process can be smooth throughout the whole product development cycle. Next, probably I will repeat some of the previous speakers, but just a couple of words on the basic principles on how integrated photonics approaches biosensing and microscopy. I will start with the top left part of my slide. So basically here you can see a sketch and the dark layer represents a waveguide basically in layer in which your light is propagated in the system. The light blue color is a cladding material around it. And the sensing is based on the fact that any kind of sample or analyte placed in contact with a waveguide will affect the propagation of the light inside it. And therefore having such kind of interaction region as a part of some sensitive optical components, such as for example, ring resonator or Maxender interferometer uh, will cause uh, a change in the optical output signal, uh, depending on the presence and amount of the analyte. A uh, similar principle applies to microscopy or imaging, but here you use your sample, say stained cell, and you place it on top of a waveguide. The light which is propagated inside the, cell, uh, inside the waveguide interacts with the markers inside the cell, excites them, they re-emit the light and allow you to do imaging. Next, uh, to the right hand side of my, of my slide, why people would opt to go for an integrated approach? Well, an ultimate goal here is to make steps toward lab on cheap devices and to be closer to point of care diagnostics approach, which means that you are able to do even complicated analytics and diagnostics without the need for complicated and expensive lab equipment. And here, integrated photonics can bring mm, footprint reduction, cost reduction, and allow mass fabrication of the devices. The next reasonable question, as I mentioned, we are silicon nitride platform. So why not to be stick to traditional silicon photonics? And here an answer is that silicon nitride is a flavor of silicon photonics and therefore it holds the same benefits, but still having some additional advantages features which you can benefit from. For example, lower loss, which can allow you having more sensitive devices. Silicon nitride as a platform is more thermally stable per se. And also it has a transparency in the visible range, which is really of high importance if you plan to work with biosamples. All of this really allow you to do a lot of interesting and great applications. Uh, for example, on cheap wide field of view super resolution imaging, or integrated spectrometers. As an example here, you can see an integrated array wave grating operating in visible wavelengths range fabricated in our platform. Next, let's move to where Ligentech can bring its expertise and be a beneficial partner for you. So our process is based on photonic grade materials, silicon nitride, silicon dioxide, 
and is really versatile in a sense that it allows a great flexibility of the approaches and the shapes that you can try. Uh, as an example here, you can see some of the uh, cross sections of the waveguides which are possible to be uh, fabricated in our platform. We have a great control over the fabrication process and therefore we can offer, for example, local and precise cladding removal, which is an essential part for sensing applications. Moreover, we have a pre-developed component library and template library, which is continually updated and can allow you fast and easy prototyping and proof of concept devices. And of course, I think to mention as many other platforms our goal and the things that we have in our roadmap is photo diet integration and laser source co-integration on a chip, which can allow you full functionality system on chip. Now going to the epic part. So what we can do for you and what you can do for us. As I mentioned, Legendtech is a chip manufacturing provider, silicon nitride based. And therefore what we can bring to you is a uh, system on cheap devices, which has, which have a broad transparency range from visible to mid infrared, really low loss uh, around 0.1 dB per centimeter in our standard process, or even below that for more advanced processes that we have. We have developed components and PDK. And what is important, we can offer fast turnaround, which means that from the order moment till you have your chips at your place, it could be as short as two months. What we are looking for and what you can do for us, basically it's on the supply chain part. We always looking for metrology partners and packaging partners, especially in the visible wavelength range. And of course, we will be interested to be in contact with people and groups or organizations who have expertise in surface functionalization to be able to address uh, more complicated requests and needs of the community. With that, uh, I will close my presentation and I'm open to any questions or comments from your side. Thank you very much, Anton. It was very, very interesting presentation. I love this uh, silicon nitride foundry. Uh, so, okay, so regarding the connections that you would like to, to make during this uh, meeting, uh, what are the companies that uh, you would like? Uh, well, I can see already look doing like this, but what are the companies that you would like to connect with? As I mentioned, we already know quite several um, members of EPIC who are of interest for us in the sense of collaboration. But to repeat again, uh, for the moment in terms of biosensing and bio-related applications, we have interest in being connected with people who have more experience than we do in terms of really bio part of the development so all the surface functionalization and knowledge of what is really needed for market in terms of specs because we can provide a versatile and mature platform but we need to have some let's say guidance from the market and our partners in a sense to define the way to go okay thank you uh, look from surfix uh, please go ahead yeah i think we should uh, we should arrange a telco to discuss yeah in a, in a sense yes. that, that we have a lot of uh, expertise in 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 modification of nitride and uh, I, I believe you've seen my presentation that we can do this in a very elegant selective manner uh, which is beneficial as well for sensitivity and reproducibility at low concentrations of analyte so uh, yeah sounds interesting we'll be really happy to with Elko and discuss. Well, I am, uh, I am also sure, Laura, uh, you would like to, to connect uh, with this uh, foundry. It, it, this is relatively new, right? Uh, Ligentech is, is, is not a super old foundry, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yes, I, I know. I mean, I, I, I know uh, Ligentech, of course, and will be also uh, quite happy to collaborate, of course. Mm -hmm. okay, very good. Uh, Anton, uh, one question: What is the capacity of um, of um, of Ligentech for making chips? So imagine that now we need uh, we need one uh, silicon nitride chip uh, for each for each um, for each uh, person in Europe. Uh, what is the capacity of Ligentech uh, for making them? As I mentioned, we have full flexibility in the sense that we can go to volume production. So it's always a question of the volumes that you need 
and the timelines that you need to achieve. And I can say that we are really capable of delivering the things that we promise to deliver. Okay, very good. So questions, uh, comments for Anton? Okay, so then maybe it's a, a good moment. I can see Bay Photonics uh, in the room. Uh, yes, Glenn. Yes, I'm here. Maybe you Hi. would like to, to talk about what are your packaging um, capabilities and what are you looking in this meeting? Yeah, well, I've attended this uh, talk because um, we don't have an awful lot of experience of biophotonics in particular, but um, photonics in general, uh, photonics in, as used in sensors, data comms, telecoms, uh, quantum space, all sorts of other um, packaging technology. So uh, uh, I, I came here to learn more about the biophotonics side. I'm sure it's, a, it's an area we'd like to get involved in. So, um, you know, if there's anything that we can help with, we'd be very happy to discuss. Thank you, Glenn. And well, and that Thanks. is sure, there is a lot of interest now for biophotonics, right? And, and diagnosis, no? Because, uh, well, this emergency of the virus. So maybe now is a good moment to introduce a company that is doing a great job in joining a consortium for a European uh, projects. Martina, uh, would you like to introduce what uh, Amires is doing for this uh, photonic community? Oh, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Yes, so I represent Amires. We are quite a small uh, company, but quite involved in the photonics community in the sense that our focus is entirely on uh, Horizon 2020 proposal preparation and project management, and also uh, company innovation coaching, mainly SMEs. Uh, so from the uh, Horizon 2020 proposals, we do both uh, process and uh, product oriented innovations. Uh, you have already heard some of them. Example, MedFab pilot line, which got recently funded from the others, where we partner uh, with Epic. And some of you uh, is also the fabulous or the JPEX uh, pilot lines. Uh, from the product oriented innovations, uh, we also had specific project. We just finished on bi developing biosensor was ultra placard plasmonic based device with integrated nanostructures for the uh, early detection of a colorectal cancer from liquid biopsy, which is example of the other side. This was device developed for Horiba, which uh, actually, uh, as I mentioned, already finished and uh, was quite successful project. So in case you are interested in uh, building partnerships, getting into Horizon 2020 projects. Uh, we are quite flexible in terms of uh, providing the services from the, just co uh, commenting up to the entire proposal preparation, uh, value chain development and uh, proposal writing. We often take uh, a step on the uh, impact preparation uh, and of course the implementation. So, Thank you very much, Martina. Yes, thanks, great Anna. introduction from Ires. Okay, and well, this is perfect to introduce uh, the, our next speaker of today. Uh, one of the most successful uh, pylon lines, the PIXAP pylon line for packaging and assembly. So yes, this is the turn of Nuria uh, from IMEC, who is going to talk about how to go to large volumes uh, in, in, for the biosensing, biosensor disposable. So please, uh, Nuria. Hello, uh, everybody, and thanks, Anna, for the introduction. So indeed, today I will be presenting the European-funded PIXAP pilot line with a focus on the developed demonstrator system for biosensing applications. Um, so uh, despite of all the benefits that uh, they provide, integrated photonic sensors are not yet massively uh, deployed in the market. And if we take a look at how the effort is spread along the process flow from a concept or a successful demonstration in the lab, to a product which is ready for distribution, we can see that the assembly, packaging, and testing involve more than 80% of the total cost, and they are very time consuming. So this is, uh, represents a bottleneck for large scale uh, volume manufacturing. In addition, uh, the industry in uh, Europe is uh, distributed and fragmented, which represents another factor for the existing gap between photonic research results and product development. In order to break this gap, uh, an European-funded pilot line, PIXAP, started in January 2017. The main goal of PIXAP is to combine Europe's assembly and packaging 
technology leaders into a single point open access pipeline, providing European industry with an easy access to a wide range of advanced and assembly packaging technologies. The accessibility to companies is provided by establishing a gateway, which is located at Tyndall National Institute in Ireland, to coordinate the large number of partners that are distributed across Europe. The key element of Fixup Pilot Line is the standardization of different steps, from the design to the assembly into a ready-to-use system. The involved research is therefore devoted to establish, mature, and integrate standardized building blocks into concrete demonstrator systems, such as the bio demonstrator I will be presenting today. The main idea behind Fixup Pilot Line can be exemplified with Legos. They have standard components, size, color, shapes, with a standardized assembly system which can be rapidly combined to create all kinds of structures. If a new component is designed, it will follow the same rules that their predecessors, ensuring its compatibility. In an analogous way, the PIXAP uh, pilot line offers a menu of building blocks that can be integrated in more complex systems. In the developed via sensor cartridge that I'm presenting today, these building blocks are the PIC, the microfluidic cartridge, a block with an array of micro lenses, and the spot antibodies. So let's now talk of the bio demonstrator, which is one of the four demonstrators developed within Pixar pilot line. This bio demonstrator is intended to showcase the high potential for developing mass scale, cost-effective multiplexer biosensor, paving the way for fast delivery of rapid diagnostics at the point of care. As already commented, a rapid point of care testing system requires the development of consumable, easy to use and low cost packaging sensing cartridges, but also a com in combination with a solid external compact reader. As mentioned before, there are two main challenges to be addressed during this biosensing uh, cartridge development. One of them is the development of uh, manufacturing process flow, which is completely compatible with the biofunctionalization. So no assembly step uh, affects the surface biochemistry. For example, the assembly of the peak into the microfluidic cartridge involves a UV illumination to cure the glue in the fixation points, which is potentially could uh, damage the biosensor. Other example could be the limitation on thermal steps that can be performed after the biofunctionalization. Other important challenge is to develop a tolerant and passive interface in optical coupling system, which is a key element for easy to use disposable photonic sensors. So there in the image, you can uh, show how they look the developed sensing cartridges and a detail of the back of uh, the cartridge in which a uh, pick is assembled in such way that it protrudes uh, out of the cartridge serving as a mechanical alignment feature. We can see how the system uh, has been designed in these uh, pictures. So in order to perform a measurement, the user should place the chip against a corner of a dedicated shallow groove under the fiber array and fix it via a simple mechanical clamp. Then close the hinge arm for electrical contact and connect the tubes to the inlet and outlet of the cartridge. The readout unit provides free space optical coupling uh, through an array of lensed fibers and electrical contact through spring-loaded pogo pins. As mentioned before, the use of disposable cartridges calls for a highly tolerant interfacing system, allowing fast and easy uh, cartridge replacement. In order to increase the intrinsic tolerances of the fiber to grating coupling, the expanded beam coupling concept is implemented. This optical interfacing approach consists in introducing a pair of micro lenses one on the tip of the fiber and one on the chip. So the beam is expanded in the free space between the source and the detector. This system results in an increase of tolerance to mispositioning, especially in the axial direction. So the fiber can be located several millimeters away from the chip, enabling the insertion of the cartridge into the reader. Measurements reveal no penalty on the chip coping efficiency using this uh, approach. Now I would like to show the developed process flow through the achieved results. Uh, after functionalizing with an epoxy self-assembled monolayer, the silicon nitride peaks from Fix for Life are assembled with a glass block containing an array of micro lenses. We can see in the pictures the metallic, uh, me metallic aligning marks used to accurately position the micro lenses on top of the grating couplers and the electrical contacts in the opposite side of the lens block. The samples are then spotted with the desired antibodies, in this case, C-reactive protein antibodies. And in the picture, we can appreciate the spotted areas corresponding to the open clads of uh, one of the arms of the five times multiplexed mass sender interferometers, which are the sensing structures in this demonstrator. In a final step, the assembled and spotted chips are packaged in the polymer microfluidic cartridge. We can observe all the previously mentioned building blocks integrated in a biosensing cartridge. 
The first immunoassay in a fully assembled cartridge was performed at IMEX in house setup. Uh, after optical alignment and temperature stabilization, a reference diluent was injected and the spectra of one of the mat sender interferometers was monitored over time. A dilution of CRP of 140 nanograms per liter was applied and three minutes later, a washing step with the reference diluent was performed. If we plot this uh, wavelength shift with respect time, we can easily distinguish the changes produced by the flushing of the sample and diluent and see that after the bioassay is performed, the baseline has shifted approximately 2.6 nanometers. This baseline shift is an indication that the analyte has been captured in the sur surface of the mat sender interferometer arm. Thus, this test uh, represents a demonstration of the biosensing capabilities accomplished within the PIXAP packaging assembly flow for clinical relevant CRP concentrations. And here concludes my story. Do you have questions? Okay, thank you very much, Nuria. It was great, the presentation. Ah, I think uh, Laura has a first uh, question. Laura, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, I, I would like to know, Nuria, why, I mean, you have shown the result with the CRP protein and the sensitivity, in my, in my opinion, is very bad. I mean, why you got this, I mean, this uh, very high, I mean, even with plasmonic, we go even down to one nanogram yeah. per milliliter in urine. I mean, so, yeah, I would like to clarify. Uh, so what we are doing with Impixab with this demonstrator is just to, to, to demonstrate that packaging is not affecting this. This has been the first test perform so indeed we plan to to yeah to valid further validate uh, these results uh, so yeah it has been the first uh, demonstration just that uh, there is a binding happening there that the uh, uh, different steps didn't uh, completely yeah ruin the bioassay and now we should uh, yeah for the test for that for for instance maybe uh, if you have some suggestions of what would be for you uh, i mean it's not um, it's not intended to, within this project uh, to go for a full uh, characterization. But if you think like there is some marker or some concentration, some volume, something that would give it a good indication that uh, is performing good. But then we have used, in fact, I mean, even Anna also, we have used also this technology from IMEC, the Mac Thunder devices in silicon nitride from IMEC and a project for tuberculosis detection and we were we were able to to have very good result with this technology and also with the detection of the tuberculosis in the urine of the real patients from africa and we got very good result with the technology from imec uh, the first max sender in silicon nitride they were fabricated in imec uh -huh. so we can you can take also a look to this and it was with, with your technology Mm -hmm. Laura, what do you think about these micro lenses for the bimodal web guides? I think that it could be, you know, for disposable um, devices, mm -hmm. it really relaxes tolerances for the coupling and uncoupling uh, of light. What okay. do you think? I would like to see these micro lenses on top of the bimodal web guides. Well, I mean, at this moment, we don't have, I mean, the problem, I mean, with the coupling uh, is just we are solving this with uh, free space. I mean, uh, and fire coupling will be another solution. And also just in, I mean, speaking about this problem of the uh, consumables uh, and also related with the vessels and the lasers and so on, I'm going to be more provocative and to say we have to think also about uh, environmentally, uh, environmental issues because if we have to do, for example, in this COVID-19 imaging, we have to do thousands of analysis per day. Are we going to throw away? with all these consumable and lasers and so on. So we have to be aware uh, of everything. Yeah, this is so, but in any case, I mean, uh, I think my approach is more uh, to be able to have the cartridge only with the sensor and the microfluidics and like a very small plastic where you can have this disposable. But of course I am open to any solution that is uh, cheap and uh, okay. this is just a provocative uh, uh, <laughs> for everybody that we have to think also in the environment. Huh? Okay. okay, so any comment, um, question for Nuria? Okay, so if there are not more questions, maybe we can uh, move ahead with the program. With the program. Uh, and the next uh, speaker is uh, Roland Terbor from uh, ICFO. Hi, many thanks. So I will share my screen. Yeah, um, so many thanks to the 
organizers of these epic meetings. I think they are very good. And also, I would like to thank all the audience, the ones in the present and maybe also the ones in the future, the ones that will look at this in the recorded version. And what I want to show you uh, is the lens interferometric microscope, which is the technology that we have been developing at ICFO and how we use it for label-free detection of biomarkers. So first, for the ones that maybe don't know ICFO, ICFO is an institute located in Barcelona. It's quite big. So we have also very nice numbers on the academic uh, side, but I would like to highlight that we also have a very good history of collaborations with industrial projects and companies. So maybe if some company out there wants to know more, maybe you want to visit ICFO when everything is a bit more normal than now. Within ICFO, we have the KTT, the Knowledge Technology Transfer Unit. And this is the bridge between what happens in the labs and the problems that are out there in the real world. And also with the industry and hospitals. So we have collaborations with, uh, through them. And in the launch pad, there are uh, the launchpad of KTT has successfully um, uh, yeah, uh, incubated seven spin-offs, and there are a few more in the pipeline. So, sorry for interrupting, Roland. Ah, okay, you, yes, if you can move the... Yeah, you can see that. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. I know that it was... Good, now it's good. Huh? So what is the LIM? The LIM is this lens free interferometric microscope that we developed, and it's... I mean, as the name says, it doesn't, it doesn't work with lenses. So it's a full interferometric holographic microscope. And we do imaging of specially transparent surfaces. We like to have the measurements, the thickness of very thin samples, like this, this transparent sample of uh, silica patterns that are only 10 nanometers thick on glass. But we can do uh, many more kinds of material analysis. And the detection range in this z-axis, the, the in optical path difference is very good. So we go from 0 0.1 nanometers up to a few hundreds of nanometers. Of course, it's not all super nice. We have our image resolution in the X and Y is not as good as in a typical microscope because we don't use lenses. It's 10 microns. But I think this is not always necessary for all the applications. and. Instead of that, we have a very good field of view and we don't need any to do any mechanical scanning or focusing. So this is also a very good feature if you want to do fast measurements. We have a compact device. We can change the light source and the measurements are about one minute, but we are currently working on the real time measurements depending on the technology on the application. We have these applications in mind, optical quality, material science, and metrology. So if anyone is interested in this, you can contact us later. But specifically for this meeting, uh, we use it also for the label-free detection of biomarkers. So for this, we use the same device, of course, but we also use a microarray cartridge, which contains several spots with specific receptors. These receptors have, uh, for example, antibodies or, or the DNA strand that you want to detect. And then you have also a plasmonic substrate that we use to enhance the signal. And on top of this plasmonic substrate, we have the receptors. And these will capture the biomarkers that will be in the sample that you want to detect. When we introduce this in our optical reader, what you can see here, the reader is in principle, a Maxender interferometer, just that we replicate it several times. So we have a continuous Maxender. And we see the differences in the film thickness, this biofilm thickness, that uh, changes depending on the concentration of the biomarkers with a very good sensitivity of 0 0.1 nanometers. And that's why we don't need labeling. This is more or less how it looks like. I mean, this is a zoom in of the full microarray and we have some spots with the biomarkers that we want to, uh, with the receptors for those biomarkers we want to detect. And after 30 minutes, we have this signal, uh, this increase in the signal. So in this case, the limit of detection was 500 nanograms per milliliter. But in other cases, we have also preliminary results with a commercial chip. We managed to get 10 nanograms per milliliter. 
And also in another uh, experiment we had, in another setup, we had 50 picograms per milliliter with a secondary step. So we have a device with a nice sensitivity and we need to validate it for a real case. So we chose sepsis as this case because it's a global health problem. It is a whole body inflammatory reaction. It's caused by severe infection and it has a high mortality rate. There are many death, deaths per year and also the costs due to hospitalizations are very uh, large, unfortunately. And what I'm going to show you is what resulted from this collaboration in the RISE project, in the European RISE project, where we collaborated with the Hospital of Valdebron, with ICN2, with a group from Laura Lechuga, and also with the BIOS group at EPFL from Professor Ati Jaltuk. We managed to detect three biomarkers. Well, we detected many more, but these are some of the most relevant biomarkers, which are E. coli, C-reactive protein, procalcitonin, which are bacteria, protein, and a peptide, all within the relevant range for sepsis. And we carried out the preclinical tests at the Hospital of Valdebron with real samples with, from real patients. And we were able to accurately differentiate bacterial sepsis patients, healthy individuals, and systemic inflammatory response syndrome patients. So this is not the only possible application. We have others in, in mind. And uh, what we have now, we continue developing the platform and we have now a label-free biosensing platform, which is rapid. It takes about 30 minutes to deliver the first results. And we have a very high sensitivity, uh, biofilm sensitivity and also biomarker sensitivity and concentration. But most importantly, because we use the microarrays and we can multiplex this signal, these measurements, we can carry out about thousands of tests simultaneously. And also you can select the different kinds of receptors that you want. So you could detect from microRNAs to proteins, peptides, and up all the way up to bacteria. So this is very versatile. Also, we use very low sample volumes and we aim at having a very uh, inexpensive cartridge with our patented technology. So what we look for, we look for industrial partners for large scale manufacturing and also we look for other potential applications. So if anyone out there is interested in this technology, uh, we are happy to hear about it. Wow, this is, I've been following this and I'm so excited and now you have the whole smart limb unit like this and that you're looking for further production. So here you have the whole supply chain of companies who are willing to help you. And, and now I think it's time for you to tell us what would be the ideal partnership out of all these people that you could write the Santa Claus Christmas lead. Which one would you like to have a beer with after this meeting? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Yeah, so, I mean, as Laura already mentioned, I mean, it's not only about the technology and all this, it's also the packaging. I mean, this is a very difficult part. Um, so I don't know, I, I'm impressed and I'm happy to see some of the people that uh, have presented before. And I, I mean, without uh, being too specific, but also EV Group and UNM Research, I think they presented some very nice things. I think we will have to talk later and whenever people tell me that packaging is the biggest challenge then i go to my to my best friend in the packaging industry which is bob musk bob has been working with different different uh, companies and different european projects as well from the european times uh, bob uh, when it comes to packaging for the biosensing community what kind of things have you seen developing and what do you think is the current the the, the, the current challenge and the common challenge we've been having in the last years for this market uh, the biggest challenge, I've worked with quite a number of startups and research um, facilities where they, they make a benchtop sensor, biosensor, and they have no idea how to transfer that into a product. And the trick is transferring that into a product. I think we're, we're hearing much about that today, where people are starting to concentrate on how to actually manufacture these sensors. And it's really important. I think some, some of the points were brought up today about the disposability and the simplicity of the products, because the volumes that are going to be needed, particularly in the COVID situation, are tremendous. And there are more challenges than I think we recognise there. But I think that the most important thing is being able to transfer that concept and that tested unit into something that you can, well, the rest of the world can manufacture easily. 
Fantastic. Uh, Roland, we have a question for you and also for Nuria afterwards uh, from the company Icon Photonics. They are wondering about the tolerances for micro lens approach in the packaging. For micro lens? Yeah, or for fiber or for encoupling of the light. Uh, okay. Uh, no, I mean, this is a good question. I mean, we don't use lenses. We collimate the light. I mean, that's true. I, I'm skipping some of the technical details. We can talk later. But actually, we have very good tolerances with this kind of, of uh, errors because the sensitivity, what we do is we record all the hologram. So any kind of small perturbation is later subtracted. So we haven't had many uh, problems with this, nor with vibrations. It's a very stable device. I mean, I have to say we're very proud of that. You, you look very proud and I'm very proud of seeing this into production. Before we go to the next stage of production, we go to Nuria. Nuria, what do you have to say about this? What are the tolerances for the encoupling of the light? Well, uh, yeah, the tolerances will uh, really depend on, on which uh, scale we are talking about. If we are talking about of something that you are developing on the lab or if you are scaling that in a company. So if you, you mean this kind of tolerances for positioning? Yes. Yeah, so those tolerances will depend, of course, of the concrete technology use and, and, the, and yeah, how the system is, is just on that. So at the moment, what we are building is a demonstrator. And what we have tried, what I can tell you, is like this system uh, we have been uh, looking on to inserting uh, many times the chip and to see how, what is the, the loss. And basically what we have demonstrated it is, would be is um, this system allows for a passive replacement of the chip and the total ambition loss uh, could be a maximum of a deviation of 10 dB. 10 dB. So we are talking this, uh, just talk to me in the, in the, for, for the vertical coupling in micrometers. Are we talking two and a half, five microns? So I would say positioning, um, so what we did is to insert these chips, and I think it can be in the range in the lab of uh, yeah, a few micrometers. I think I Icon Photonics is very excited about this. They can have a collaboration based on that. Uh, another question for Ligentech. They are wondering mm -hmm. about this is a company. Declan is working for a company called Yellow. They make fantastic caps, but they also make fantastic burning test systems. They are wondering if you are using any kind of burning for the testing of your photonic devices. Uh, yes, so as a part of our offering, we do also microheater integration, which can allow you all the thermo optical phase tuning and other cool features. And therefore, to be able to ensure that we have all the needed quality control procedures and that we have all the needed information for our customers, of course, we do quite a lot of burning tests also. Declan, good to see you so far away from Belfast. Excited that you're here, part of the meeting. Also, the rest of the YouTube. We go to New Chatel. We go to CSCN. Stefano, thank you very much for staying until the end and for telling us how we can help CSCN. The floor and the attention of everyone is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, actually, we go to Lanquart because I work for the CSCN center in Lanquart. Um, but the, the headquarters of CSCN is, of course, in New Chatel. So let me just share the screen. All right, so um, thank you very much for the invitation for this excellent meeting. I'm Stefano Cattani, I'm a, a section head at the CSCM in Lanquart, and today I have the pleasure to present you some of the activities of CSCM in the field of optical biosensors. So for those of you that don't know CSCM, we are a private RTO, research and technology organization in Switzerland, and our mission is the development and the transfer of technologies to the industrial sector, mostly in Switzerland, but also in Europe. And we're about 500 people in five locations in, in Switzerland. So in the photonic domain, we are quite active. Um, I think in this community, you know, CSCM, we already are collaborating with many of the people present today. We have technologies going from components, uh, from, for example, micro optics, plasmonics, and then integrating that with packaging and various technologies to form actually complete systems for different applications. And we are also very active in the, at the European level. For example, we are a member of the photonic pilot lines that have been mentioned today. And um, especially myself, I'm working also in the MedFab uh, pilot line which is dedicated to photonic medical devices and 
We are, of course, collaborating also very actively with EPIC. And maybe in this audience, what is not so known is that we also have large activities in life science at CSTM. Also here going from um, surface technologies for surface modification, uh, chemical fun functionalization. Um, then we have several technologies for biosensors, not only optical, but also electrochemical biosensors and electronic biosensors. And also here, we always try to integrate all these technologies into systems that also include readout and communication for bio applications. Now, since the focus today is optical biosensors, in the next slide, I will go through a few, a few examples of projects that we've been working on and technologies involving optical biosensors. So the first system I want to mention is what we call the Inca system. It's actually um, a microfluidic chip for carrying out multiplex fluorescence assays. And it consists of two components, the, the chip with integrated sensing spot. And then we have a, a unit for fluidics and temperature control. And right now we are developing this system further within European projects, for example, the Horizon 2020 HEDIMED project that just started. In this project, we are developing a portable system for allergy screening at the point of care. And also very recently, we started a project with the Swiss com company Adamant Innotech for the development of a serological test for COVID-19. Um, another technology that CSTM has developed several years ago is label-free waveguide biosensing. We've heard today other examples of similar technologies. I don't have to go through the detail, but basically we are measuring molecular binding at interfaces via the change in the refractive index. And in our approach, we use grating couplers for detecting this, and then specific biorecognition mo molecules on the surface. In this case, we are not working so much on the development of the technology anymore. As you see, this has been integrated already in prototypes, but together with partners, we are more working on the development of new assays for medical diagnostics and for food analysis. Um, another technology, another interesting technology, it's uh, oxygen sensing. We developed a system for monitoring optical, um, optically monitoring oxygen concentration in cell cultures. Uh, using fluorescent quenching. And here our speciality is actually the, the layer, the porous layer that encapsulates the dye, which is in contact with the liquid. And then the optical readout, which has been integrated in a package that's compatible with microscopes. So it's the same format than uh, an objective. You can mount it in the same stage um, as an ob objective in any microscope. It's a collaboration with the company EBD, among others. And then we also moved this concept to 2D, so to the measurement of fluorescence lifetime imaging in 2D. We have um, a prototype that you see here, a handheld prototype for uh, measuring a 2D map of fluorescence lifetime in the nanosecond to microsecond domain. And it's based on time of flight image sensors that uh, CSTM has originally developed for uh, um, 3D imaging. Now the sensor, the main application right now, it's, uh, it's anti-counterfeiting, so not really in the, the bio domain, but uh, the company PCO has developed recently a high-end camera based on a CMOS chip that was co-designed by CSCM for scientific application like measuring slim in cells um, coupling to a microscope. In the beginning, I mentioned plasmonic sensors. We also heard some examples today. That's uh, an example for a, from a running um, European project called Moloco, where we are developing a plasmonic optical chip together with other partners uh, for measuring toxins, antibiotics, and other quality parameters in milk. And our role here is the integration of resonance sub-wavelength gratings in this uh, optoplasmonic system. And the final example is a, a very recent project. It's a postdoc for industry that we started with EPFL. And uh, here we are developing a glucose sensor and a lactate sensor based on measuring the fluorescence change induced by an analyte into the, um, the intrinsic fluorescence of single wall carbon nanotubes. 
So the technology was um, demonstrated at EPFL for glucose. And now within this postdoc, our focus is on one hand to extend this to different analytes, such as lactate and other analytes, and also to miniaturize the setup going from um, um, tabletop setup that was used uh, until now to something that is more miniaturized. So moving on, moving on to my final slides that uh, Jose uh, favorite question. So what can we offer and what, what we are looking for? So what we offer, we offer actually the whole chain from feasibility studies to concepts and also the development of technologies, prototyping. And we can support partners in the industrialization of products. And what we are looking for is on the, um, the industrial side, we are looking for industrial partners that, uh, that would like to collaborate with us for development projects and in technology transfer. But we are also very open to academic collaborations with partners that can bring complementary technologies. And I've seen many today. So I'm going to contact uh, some of the guests because it was very, very exciting technologies presented today. Of course, in this case, it's not so easy to say. I think it's uh, project specific what we need. But if I have to point out an area, I would say that sample collection and pretreatment are definitely a subject where we could benefit from collaborations with partners because this is not uh, maybe our main expertise. So here you have again all my uh, contact coordinates. I think you can also find them on the EPIC website and I will, will be very happy to answer questions or to uh, receive your, your contact request. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Stefano. I am so impressed for the for the huge uh, different technologies that you have presented in a few minutes here. So, well, uh, let's say let's um, choose one of the challenge that you could have to improve your technology, and uh, let's see if we can help you. So, what will be this uh, challenge that you would like to to share uh, with the companies? I think some of the challenges have been mentioned today, so I definitely agree that, for example, in um, biomedical applications, measuring with real samples. So of course, a very different story than uh, proof of principles in the lab. And you see many technologies which are very exciting in the lab and have a huge sensitivity, but then um, they fail to be accepted in the real world because you, you end up with other uh, problems. So maybe quite often as physicists, we tend to focus on the, um, the sensitivity of the transducer itself. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, as we know, then with biological measurements, you have you have other problems like non-specific binding and uh, these kind of, uh, of limitations. Mm -hmm. so that's definitely, I think, one uh, challenge for uh, um, for the integration of these sensors. And yeah, I think that's that's um, what I could bring to the discussion. Okay, because we have a company here that didn't talk yet, uh, James from Scott. What are you interested in this meeting? I will say is microfluidics, well, it's also microoptics, right? But you can make very nice glass microfluidics, right? That's right, that's right. Thank you, Anna. Um, yeah, so shot over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, we've, we've expanded our microfluidic uh, diagnostic capabilities with the acquisition of an Australian company called Minifab. And that really kind of expands our interest in other areas, including um, biosensors, which is an area that traditionally we haven't been in. So my interest today is, is just to kind of see and understand uh, the different conversations that are happening in this market and kind of get some familiarity with it and explore opportunities um, with companies that may be of interest to collaborate with in the future. And I think it's been quite successful in that regard. Thank you. Well, and I can say uh, glass microfluidics are the best to avoid bubbles, you know? Uh, yes, uh, I really had a very great experience with that. And also we have another company here, Barrio Optics, uh, Felix. Could you tell us uh, what can you offer? What are uh, your capacity in biosensing? Um, oh. Use me, now I'm, do you hear me? Yes, 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 very good. I was quiet for two hours, uh, one and a half hour. Now I can talk also. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, Varioptics is producing um, planar waveguides based on uh, polymer waveguides. And also uh, we are starting to uh, realize uh, waveguides in glass. 
and uh, we can also combine them with very um, precise mechanical structures, which helps to assemble uh, this kind of complex photonic miniaturized systems, I would say. Uh, we are also um, helping people to uh, reduce the costs by these precise mechanical uh, systems. And I could imagine that uh, one of these photonic or biomedical applications, um, uh, our technology could help to realize that. Um, yes. For example, it's also possible to realize uh, uh, very uh, small fluidic channels. We can also open the waveguide so that they are um, exposed to different um, to different medias, for example, through the immunescent field or readouts. Um, um, it's also uh, very possible, very highly integrated. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, Felix. And well, also, I would like to introduce you Atanas from Ford. Uh, would you like to introduce uh, what is your company doing in the field of biosensing? Hello, my name is Atanasia Postopoulou. I'm postdoc in the, in the ultra fast laser micro and nano processing laboratory at Ford in Greece. It, it is a research center and not a company. Uh, we are mainly working on uh, the development of artificial uh, surface. We can modify different surface by using the laser. And also we can functionalize this uh, surface, these surfaces with laser again, again, uh, to functionalize with uh, metallic nanoparticles or, of, of, or of other oxides or to functionalize with uh, biomolecules. Uh, we have some pro now we have some programs on biosensors, but based on graphene uh, biosensor, graphene based biosensor. Okay, thank you very much. So, any question, any comment for Stefano or for the other companies that just introduced themselves? I have a general question because uh, I heard only for uh, silicon based biosensor mainly. Uh, we are working on graphene based, a new technology, and I would like to ask to comment on, to comment on this. If it's easy to, to go from a silicon based technology to another technology that may be better for us uh, with better sensitivity for. So yeah, we, I wonder if Roland would like to take this. I know that Igfo is very active with other some of your colleagues in the in the bringing to volume production different technologies in detectors, mostly for, for graphene. Roland, have you evaluated the possibilities for using graphene in biosensing activities? Well, I mean, yeah, our group uh, partly uh, works on on graphene, so there are, we are a big group, and part of that works with graphene. And in fact, we are using in. Uh, together with some other uh, collaborators. I mean, not specifically me, but someone else in our group is going to use a technology for uh, SPR sensing with graphene. Yeah, so maybe okay, you know, we can also talk later. And I mean, I think it has been a really, really great meeting. I think uh, Anna is the happiest lady for a long time that uh, since, I think since I joined Tepic, she, I never seen her having so much fun. I would like to summarize the notes because at the same time I was uh, helping a bit uh, with the coordination of the meeting. I also was uh, talking with the people in WhatsApp and chatting in the YouTube channel and also making this slide. Actually for me, the biggest challenge that we have seen and everything goes towards making a disposable cartridge that looks like is the, the paradigm shift here. We want to aim and we have to make sure that everything from the manufacturing to the packaging to the components are in the low cost and volume production suitable for this. Uh, on, the, on the specific part, the manufacturing, we talk a lot about packaging as being one of the key parts and also about the in-coupling losses. We also talk, and the presentation from Surfix was spectacular. Thank you very much, Luke, for being here today. We talk about the chemistry process at the production level and the need for working with different manufacturing companies, such as, for example, we have today IMS uh, to, 
enable that particular part. We talk about the light source, and there Arne Lainze and, Lainze and two six. We had a really beautiful presentation about what are really the challenges towards building big cells as part of the cartridge for the disposability. And Arne said, cents per pixel, and two six said, um. Oh, Let's see how many you need. Micro optics was also quite uh, the interesting part of the discussion about what kind of micro optics can they be needed and what kind of volumes are they needed there, whether this is a very important part of the volume production micro optics that we are enabling in Europe through the Pyroline Fabulous. We talk about rapid detection, microarrays, low vo sample volume, and we saw the device from ICFO, this uh, smart slim. I took the picture courtesy of ICFO. I think we are really, when I see these kind of things, I see that we are really innovating in the right direction. We talk about the plasmonic enhanced field as one of the key things. When it comes to photonic integrated circuits, uh, Laura, with a great presentation, she said, simplicity, just a waveguide, separate the modes, let's go simplicity. Then Arne said, we have great mass tender st structures. And I said, because I just love ring resonators, I said, let's not forget about rings. And we talk about wavelengths, visible infrared, mid infrared. I would like to highlight also the demonstrator from Pixar that was presented by Yuga and Timec and how they actually managed to, with the use of micro, uh, of micro lens, having a very efficient coupling of a single mode fiber into a great coupling in silicon photonics. And finally, I really borrowed this from Laura because I loved it. It was the whole supply chain from the fabrication of the chip all the way to the optical readout, all the different parts of the supply chain and what kind of collaborations we need to do. Let me once more remind you, this is not a webinar. This is a potential place for you to find partners, suppliers, and customers. So if you want to contact any, any of the participants today, this goes for the Zoom channel as well as the YouTube channel. Let me know. And I'm here so happy to formulate these introductions, almost as happy as Sana is for talking about biosensors for two and a half hours, two hours and 33 minutes. Sorry for the three minutes delay. Until the next time, keep being epic, keep being healthy, keep staying at home. The virus is almost over. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.